Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Atwood Unleashed 115. It's been a whirlwind week for Russell Brand News, and we have a slew of guests coming on tonight. I think about a dozen or so, mostly to talk about Russell Brand in our Russell Brand round table panel discussions, which are going to go on for the next two plus hours. So we're going to have a variety of viewpoints, and we're going to be taking your questions live. And we're going to start out looking at Stephen Knight's Substack, which is focused on the, it's called the Knight Report. And the headline this week is why Russell Brand's YouTube channel was really demonetized. Why was it really demonetized, Stephen? Well, I think a lot of people think big conglomerates like YouTube might have some sort of ethical backbone or principles it's completely untrue they care about money and, and that's the bottom line and they're not like kind of grandstanding on principle with these allegations against russell brand what they've noticed is that if they keep allowing him to make money on their platform a lot of the big advertisers you know your big car companies your big drinks companies might just say if you keep putting our adverts on the videos of a man who's been accused of some very serious crimes we'll pull our partnership with you and you won't get any money because i mean as you know as we all know if you spent a little bit of time on youtube youtubers get a tiny little fraction of the advertising ready uh, uh, revenue from their videos the lion's share of it goes into the pocket of youtube themselves so russell brand at the minute kind of represents uh, a bit of a threat to their wallet if nothing else so that that's the main boring reason why he's been demonetized in my opinion so does the impetus for that come from the sponsors the corporations themselves or is it users of their products contacting these companies and lobbying for them to take the action it's definitely both so we've had historical examples with other platforms like patreon where the the sponsors or the payment providers have said you get that person off your platform or we pull our support and that's happened we also know there's a number of really influential activists and lobby groups in the uk who are constantly going after advertisers that place their ads with gb news or the daily mail or or anyone who's quote unquote problematic and applying pressure and giving this kind of signal to these companies that there is a huge potential PR disaster down the road if they don't do something about this issue that appears to be big news on social media. So it's, it's definitely both. It's the advertisers themselves not wanting the PR and it's advertisers having pressure put on them by pressure groups. So viewers, if you're wondering who we're going to be interviewing tonight, it's going to be fast paced. Many people are going to be getting their perspectives in. And from six to seven, I've got the first round table. We're going to be having the last American Vagabond founder, Ryan Christian, providing us his unjaded approach that will hopefully offer some common sense to the current ambiguous news cycle surrounding Russell Brand. Then we've got a long-term friend of the channel, America's Untold Stories presenter, Eric Hunley, from six to 6.30. He's back only seven days removed from his last appearance here. At 6.30 p.m. mark, Eric is going to be handing over to Macro Aggressions podcast host, Charlie Robinson, 6.30 to 7, who will be dropping in for his regular fix of AU. And who have you got in your panel at 7, Stephen? A plethora, plethora or plethora? I'm going to go with plethora <laughs> of guests with varied views. We've got YouTuber, author, and American attorney, Rebecca Zung. Uh, she published her book, Slay the Bully, recently, which discusses how to deal with narcissists. Her book covers things like the psychology of how narcissists act in negotiations and offers actual proven strategies, tactics, and step-by-step -step guidance on how to effectively create leverage so that you can shift the dynamic and create a fair resolution. Uh, tonight she'll be applying her knowledge to the brand revelations and revealing whether in fact she thinks the former tv presenter is a narcissist uh joining rebecca is uh and sophie is uh charlotte the baroness who has amassed a sizable following on twitter for her connector of voices persona and allegiance to the tinfoil hat uh, so at 7.30, James uh, Bloodsworth will be joining the same roundtable discussion. Uh, James made a name for I'm being I'm being upstaged again by this beautiful boy. He's got the hiccups. <laughs> oh. we, we, we promised to do a Ziggy reveal. Oh, calm down, doggy. We promised to do a Ziggy reveal to the viewers earlier. And here he is, 12 pounds of him. He's the proper little Hulk, aren't you, love? 
<laughs> Keep going, Stephen. Keep going. <laughs> okay, so James Bloodworth will be joining us from 7.30 to 8. Uh, James has made a name for himself going undercover at Amazon and exposing their terrible labour violations. Tonight, he'll be dis discussing his article on Substack entitled The Meaning of Russell Brand. And also joining that chat at 7.30 will be political commentator and freelance writer Charlie Sanson. Uh, Charlie has appeared on the BBC News, Sky News, GB News, and many others. Uh, so lots going on there. Uh, and directly after that, between 8 o'clock uh, and just before 9, the last guest on YouTube is journalist Patrick Boyle, who featured heavily in the recent Netflix documentary, Scouts Honor, The Secret Files of the Boy Scouts of America. Uh, Patrick was the journalist that broke the story that uncovered the history of systemic sex abuse in the Boy Scouts of America and is now an advocate for, re uh, for reform in youth organizations across America. Wow, big topics tonight. Yeah, I've started to watch that documentary. It's harrowing, but it's such an important story to be told. One of the surprising things that I heard was I thought that the church was the biggest criminal enterprise involved in adults who are attracted to kids. But according to the stats put at the beginning of that documentary, it was the Boy Scouts of America eclipsed the church with what well, went on there. So that let was... me put your mind at rest about that. The Boy Scouts of America is a very religious organization. So I think it, I think it is a Christian organization, isn't it? So I think it's, it's a kind of competition to see who's the worst Christian organization at this point. So it's got that aspect to it as well. And then at nine-ish, we're going over to Locals. I'm doing some pre-records that are going to come later in the week. We've got Kevin Annette, who's been a friend of the channel for years. And he gets into exposing the kind of things we were just talking about, especially when it comes to the upper members of society, the church, royalty, the Canadian government, etc. And after Kevin, we've got Dr. Daniel Ganser. Speaking to us about his book, USA, The Ruthless Empire, and how the CIA has played a huge part in its expansion. So huge thank you to all the people who've signed up to our locals. Link is in the description box. It's free to join. We had 500 people join in the last couple of days. And there's tons of comment on the that we have. It's free to watch, and we've been unable to put it on YouTube. It's just been recorded recently, including an hour with Ryan Dawson on the Twin Towers Part 1. We're doing a series with him. We're doing Who Killed E series with him over there. And we also had Jason Horsley on. He talked about was, is Russell Brand a, um, you know, an asset kind of thing. And we had to put the balance over on locals. So check that out. So, Stephen, with all this news about Russell Brand, all the information coming in, what's your gut telling you here? Well, I think, uh, and this one might, might annoy a few people, but I think if you're going to be objective, you have to say the Times and Dispatches are reputable outlets. Now, you may disagree with that, but I'd, have to, I'd, I'd then have to ask compared to what. And this isn't a sort of like one allegation of a sort of um, slighted ex. It's a, you know, a number of allegations from different women who don't know each other who are, you know, across different countries, have met him in different scenarios at different times, different roles, all of this together. And this would have heavily gone through a very strident legal process at these uh, publications. Seems to me on the face of it, certainly worth considering as true. It, it seems like they are credible allegations to me. Now, this doesn't mean that this sort of thing doesn't need to be a police matter and that shouldn't primarily be where these accusations go. But I do understand that, you know, a lot of investigations in this sort of thing from the media have actually led to criminal prosecutions or certainly exposes or, you know, justice. You just have to look at, say, Rolf Harris, for instance, Jimmy Savile, people like that, uh, perhaps Bill Cosby. That all started from, you know, a very heavy media scrutiny uh, and printing testimony from the alleged victim. So I think we should certainly keep an open mind. And I think it's perfectly reasonable to say, you know what, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, let's see what the courts say. Uh, I don't think at this point we can outright tar him as a, a, a criminal. Uh, but on the plus, you know, on the flip side of that, I think it's a little bit, you know, much to claim that this is all absolutely 100% false and is part of some conspiracy to bring down the great thinker Russell Brand because he's somehow a threat to the establishment. That doesn't that doesn't 
that doesn't wash with me, I'm afraid. All right. So my viewpoint is then that irrespective of innocence or guilt, we've only heard the prosecutions, the tabloid side of the story and the whole thing, if it's going to evolve into a court of law, then all of the evidence needs to be examined thoroughly. And only at that point then would I be able to ascertain, you know, more realistically of what's happened here. But irrespective of whether he is innocent or guilty, I do suspect that the whole situation has been co-opted or vested interests have greased it along so that he can get removed. Because the things he was saying about Big Pharma, um, things during the pandemic, the things, the kind of things that got Joe Rogan in trouble. It, it just seems that everybody that's got a massive following that speaks out about those things, some kind of campaign is launched against them with Joe Rogan. You know, they went back many years where he was quoting someone who used the N word and they made it look as if he'd used it himself to try and destroy him. So it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. You know, some people have said that because the allegations and the accusers have said these things, he's got to be guilty right away. I think that's just jumping to a conclusion too fast. He has his lawyers right now looking over the whole situation. I know more allegations have come in and I'm sure he's going to put out a statement at some point because Sound of Freedom, Tim Ballard, and one of the producers of Sound of Freedom, just in the last couple of days, allegations have come out against them as well. Uh, it just seems to be like a wave of this right now. And all these people who the allegations are getting attached to are outspoken on certain issues that are upsetting some of the biggest companies in the world and affecting their bottom line. I mean, if you're talking about the military industrial complex, we're talking trillions of dollars of taxpayers' revenue that goes into these contracts. So there's been one allegation taken to London Met Police as far as I know so far. The media have received more allegations and apparently he was bra bragging that he slept with 90 women a month. Some of his staff said up to five people a day. So if there's only four in the show and they've gone over his life over four years, do you think if he was doing the full-on R word, Stephen, they would have found more people because only one of them actually has accused him of the full-on R word. As far I think as it's two. I think it's two. Oh, is it two? Okay. But I, I, I think you, there's an aspect of this where the media now are pretending that, you know, it's a crime against humanity to be promiscuous and they're dredging that up. No doubt, you know, I, I think this would be, I still think this would be a, a worthy story if it was just one allegation. It's also worth mentioning as well. This isn't an allegation, sorry, an investigation that, started the moment he started repeating you know uh points about bad farmer on his youtube channel this is an investigation that was started in 2019 it's taken them this long to get enough to where they feel comfortable publishing it so i mean people do become the targets of smear campaigns that's a complete fact of, of the way the media runs now for sure but i'm not comfortable in just dismissing this i mean i don't think the World Economic Forum go to their meetings and whip out the agenda and say, we need to do something about this Russell Brand guy on YouTube. I don't think they live in that world. I don't think they care. I don't think they see him as a threat. I don't mean, what can he do, really? What can we do with the information that he's putting out there in regards to these the establishment? Uh, I think I just think people have, have bought this excuse from him uh, too easily. And as we said at the beginning, we're going to have a variety of viewpoints on this. We've already started with it, and we're going to bring a bunch more in right now. So, Stephen, thanks for your perspective, and we will see you in an hour or so, my friend. Cheers. See you soon. Cheers. All right. Let's bring in Ryan. Let's bring in... Hello, Ryan. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Thanks for having me on. We have Richard and Eric. Got all these guys. Thanks for joining us tonight, guys. It's become the biggest story in the UK, it's, it's, you know, gone mental all over the world. And before we start to put questions to you and viewers, please put questions in the chat. I'll just introduce these guys. We have got director, journalist, presenter, editor, and co-presenter of the WTAF podcast and classified on Iconic, Richard Willett. And then we have got 
Last American Vagabond found by Ian Christian, who's going to give us an unjaded approach that will hopefully offer some common sense to this situation. And many of you are familiar with Eric Honley from America's Untold Stories. So we'll go around clockwise. I'll start with Ryan. <laughs> Ryan, what's your, what's your initial gut reaction to what's going on with Russell Brand? Well, I think there's so many directions to take this story in. I mean, the obvious point out of the gate that I think is hilarious is how you have a, a, an establishment media that is acting like it's appropriate to assume he's guilty and discuss that in that direction. While anybody assuming he's not is somehow breaking the rules. It's just it's hypocritical double standard. But th the bigger thing for me is. It's the way that this story is being used against the information that he's been sharing, right? I mean, my my original gut feeling on this, first of all, I should say out of the gate, this is probably one of the least important stories on what's really going on in the world, but yet eclipses everything else important. And I think that's one of the reasons these things happen, even if based on real allegations. But it's also just allegations, anonymous people that have been not really been verified. And so this story has kind of gotten out of control and it's 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 being used in a way that stifles other people or threatens other people that are in this field because they're worried now they're going to get you know alleged about certain things or that the media will choose to go forward on this whether or not we have evidence and i think the oh, what i was going to say is that my gut originally was you know obviously this is something that i wouldn't dismiss i mean the guy's been openly a promiscuous kind of rock star character and he was very open about that so it's certainly a likely possibility that this could have been something that he knowingly did or something he did and doesn't remember i mean all sorts of ways to go about it so i also likewise think it's kind of irresponsible for people to dismiss this because he said things about big pharma but i think that's really the place to leave it at the start it's just that we don't know and everyone's acting like they have an opinion based on their political standing and team sport politics wins the day as usual <laughs> okay over to richard let's unmute richard shall we oh, got there, we go. there you go, there we go. <laughs> i thought i'd gone deaf then but no i can hear myself <laughs> i couldn't work it out um again i'm the same there's several different strands to look at this um is he guilty or not is one strand obviously um and then there's the timing of it of when it's come out especially with this um online that used to be harms bill but they got rid of that now um so um to make it look more user friendly so that's the timing of it also you look into the funding of these uh channels and the media in itself and it all leads back to the likes of blackrock and vanguard two months ago he was speaking out and a fairly big show that 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 looked at the uh, ingoings of BlackRock at least, um, not to say again that he didn't do these things. It's all what investigative journalism should do is take the whole thing and you have to do a zoom out and zoom out and the mainstream media have no idea of how to zoom out. They focus in on one tiny little aspect and then get rid of anything that doesn't fit. And we've seen that in this context with a few young, um, at least one young lady I know who gave a, a glowing review of brand and that was uh, um, not what they wanted. So they were cherry picking. Um, and that's not, in my opinion, investigative journalism. That's you present the, you go looking for the story, you present what you find. And some, as a filmmaker on another point, um, that I could see some of these sort of things that they used are some of the techniques that they use to make it look in a certain way, which I thought was very nefarious. Um, and I think that needs to be taken into account. Again, that doesn't mean he's innocent. We don't know that. Um, only him and the person know that. But it's, it's, it's dodgy. And it, 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 it's uh, a shame that uh, that the mainstream media would stoop to that kind of programming, which I think is it, it shouldn't be allowed, especially he's only done a disservice to the young girls if it ever goes to court, But um, in my opinion. Eric, what's your thoughts? And thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> it's one of those weird situations. It reminds me a lot of Manson's case, to be honest, where you, you take somebody who really makes a good target. Now, I'm not going to say that he didn't, because two things could be true at once. I think you definitely have a coordinated hit job. Absolutely. Is it possible he did it? It's possible. I'm not going to say that it's impossible, especially with his lifestyle. And there are factors where I've heard things like exceeding consent, which can happen. There could be a consensual thing, and then somebody may take this farther than the other person thought they were going, whatever, with his drug history, things like that. I just don't know. It's really hard to um, make up my mind on it. I do think that he should not be canceled. 
at this point. It's kind of like saying, okay, you're fired from your job now. Tough shit. You're, you're going to be, you know, kicked to the side, even though you have not actually been convicted. I really would like to see how about evidence? How about a police investigation? How about an actual trial? We're all jumping the gun. And I, I believe, Ryan, you're right. Tribal politics the whole way. So if you've got any questions for the panel, put them in the chat. And just to follow on from what Eric said there, put a one in the chat if you think he shouldn't have been demonetized until there was a conviction. Put a two in the chat if you think demonetization was appropriate at this point. Ryan, what do you think about demonetization? What's it's interesting, I opened up his YouTube channel. I, I was under the impression they had removed his channel. But if it's only demonetized, that changes my perspective a little bit. But it does appear to be there in the videos I can still see. Either way, though, the, the point is it's it's kind of the same point from the beginning. I mean, think about the logic here. So now YouTube is setting a precedent, which, by the way, they've already gone down this road a long time ago. This is a very public case, though. So for some people, this is a new step where they're essentially saying you can be accused whether I mean, whether it's the gravity of how many and how the corporate media is covering it. But the simple point is you can simply be accused without ever proving something. And they're going to go, well, simply because the level of accusations, we're going to remove you from from this or or demonetize you. And either way, that's incredibly unjust. I mean, it, it, I, I quite frankly think that's illegal. I think that gets in the territory of violating the, their, their contract with each other or even just legally. You can get into the realm of, you know, the fact that he's built an industry on this, that there's revenue involved. and They just suddenly pull that plug based on something you have not proven that it, it gets into the kind of publisher versus, you know, a, a platform kind of a concept, but I think it's wildly unjust, no matter what it like where we're at right now, it's unjust. But even if it goes forward and he then gets found guilty of a crime, I still don't even understand the overlap where YouTube somehow takes this like altruistic, you know, social justice stance that they're going to remove that based on something that has nothing to do with the platform. Even if you can think that what he did was egregious, that shouldn't overlap with something like that, in my opinion, ever. I think that's a free speech concept, really. Yeah, I'm going to hand this over to Richard, but I want to say one other thing first. So I thought after watching the documentary on the Saturday night, you know, obviously a lot of people were going to be unsubscribing from him. So when I went on Social Blade, and I've been following it for the past two or three days, he actually gained 10,000 subscribers after the show, 10,000 the next day, and 20,000 yesterday. So it seems that more people are subscribing than unsubscribing. Is that a form of democracy in motion, uh, Richard? And what do you think about demonetization? Well, I think if you're trying to push the narrative um, or, or, or I suppose take down the narrative that they're trying to science him because he's getting somewhere with these big corporation companies. It's not going to help when you start demonetizing him and, and, and taking away his, his ability to earn a living. It's only proving his point more. So if you're going to do that, it'd be a really stupid thing to do, but maybe these people aren't that bright. I don't know. But when we look into it, that's just proving him right. All you're doing is going, again, it's not really helping the young girls if this is true. You're just making him a martyr. Um, I don't know. It's, so it's stupid, quite frankly, one one area. It's just proving him right. And then you look into the people behind it. And as we know, the, the likes of YouTube and Google and Channel 4, they're all, they're all connected. And the people that work for them have swapped over. Some of the Channel 4 staff now are actually former, um, I believe, former, former YouTube um, executives. So... You know, you can see the connections there. I'm trying to pull up this bit where I've got um, I've got them written down, but I can't find it. Um, so it's all connected. It isn't doing them very good. Of, cl of course, he needs to. Um, I mean, I think that most of those subscribers are waiting for him to 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 give his own to what they're not they're already waiting audience to give his own sort of like speech back. So I think that's, that's probably what they're waiting for. But um, yeah, it's it's really really strange if you look at um. They're going to go to his channel and look at his channel and they'll know it's two, just two months back, um, Black Rock Corruption Exposed. That's the video that he put out. So you're only going to go there and be kind of told that, yeah, actually the evidence is there that he was calling these people out. So I don't think they're doing a, doing a good job anyway. It just seems a bit stupid and he doesn't really need the money. So what is the point? So, Eric, what do you foresee as the best case scenario and worst case scenarios from here for Russell Brand? 
Well, let me, I want to jump on one more thing, though, before we left the YouTube demonetization, because I just read a Daily Mail article earlier, and I don't know if you guys saw it, and it's more of the pile-on. They're going after Rumble now. And the way they're doing it, if you read the article, it's pretty insidious. They go, Dan Bongino, who is a major funder of Rumble, said, go find Russell Brand on Rumble. Then they said, advertisers are still advertising. And then they named this advertiser, this advertiser, this advertiser, all appearing on his videos. That is I don't know if you call it a dog whistle, but that is definitely calling people out to go after the sponsors, attack Rumble, which, by the way, is another competing network in the middle of a lawsuit with uh, YouTube right now, multi-billion dollar lawsuit. So there's a lot going on. Now, back to your question, Sean, sorry. I don't know what the recourse is going to be because I don't know exactly where all these incidents occurred, allegedly. So we have uh, U.S. law, you have statute of limitations, you have U.K. law, you have ages of consent, like one, one individual is 16 years old. From what I understand, 16 is, is uh, within the age of consent in England, however repugnant it might be. You have other questions about um, what kind of birth control was or was not used and whether that constitutes the R word legally. Some people say it does, but it did not at the time. So can't really necessarily be charged. And that also brings up another question. What about the other direction? Everybody brings up the whole, you know, taking off of a prophylactic and that being the R word. Well, what about someone lying about being on birth control themselves? Is that R going the other direction? Nobody's asking these questions. Sean, is it okay if I interject before we get to the next question? I just don't want to get past it. And I thought it was kind of important to say, I do want to stress, thank you. I do want to stress too that you know, I, I'm trying to come at this from a very non-emotional point. I do want to agree, though, that in general, like, I don't think anybody in this conversation is is not, you know, we, we understand the, the trauma that would be there, the, the, the issues that people would go through if these are real allegations. There's, no one here is acting like that's not important, I would argue. I, I just want to, you know, I think it's important that we do come at this at a non-emotional level. And I would argue that I don't even think it's the place of anybody outside of investigators to even be hashing this out. You know what I mean? Like, we should let this go to the level of investigation. This is the court of public opinion. And I know what we're doing here is trying to do it in an objective way, where everywhere else seems to be so much the opposite. But nonetheless, still, it's this is kind of what they want from this, you know, that we're all mm -hmm. lobbying this back and forth and having this conversation. And then in two things, I just want to throw out not to get too conspiratorial, but just ask the question whether or not it may be possible, whether Russell's aware or not, that he's being used in a way to drive the things in a certain way. I will point out Rumble, the two, two of the three top backers of Rumble are BlackRock and Vanguard. We, it's like we, 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 we failed to note that. So if it's an attack through that avenue, it doesn't really line up. So it could just be a way to drive people into a new location. I mean, that gets into a deeper concept of how social engineering is supposed to work. I just want to throw that out there as a thought. And so thank you for letting me add that. Please continue. Yeah, I do appreciate that. And a viewer asked about whether it would go so far as for his bank accounts to be suppressed, as we saw recently with Nigel Farage. Anything on that? Go on, Ryan. Keep going. Yeah, yeah. I, I absolutely think that's a, 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 I mean, that's going to happen. It already is happening. Nigel Farage, I believe, we saw it during the, the trucker convoys. I believe there was, I don't know if Bridge did end up having a financial aspect, but there's uh, Dr. P, Dr. Uh, Joseph Mercola has already had his account taken down and individuals within his circles, even the children of people he worked with had their, had their entire bank accounts frozen. I mean, it's, that's happening. So whether it goes to the level with somebody like this, I mean, if they're already pulling monetization, flirting with censorship because of allegations, like let's just imagine this goes further and somebody publicly comes out and says, I am this person's name. And I, I, I would, I'd be willing to bet we would see something to that regard that gets into the whole kind of ESG social mindset of a lot of these things where these banks are going to go, well, we don't want to be associated with that. And whether they actually care about these things or not, it's, it's a, it's a machine. Like that's how I see all of this. This machine has been kicked into action and that machine doesn't really care whether these are true or not. It's about using this politically. Like we said in the beginning for those people, I would say. Richard, you're a presenter for Iconic. And, you know, we've interviewed David many times on the channel. And I imagine that he's gone through similar things with sponsors and banks and stuff like that. Is there anything you could elaborate on there? Yeah, well, he's been banned from, I think it's 23 
European countries for um, for wanting to turn up at a peace rally, which is absolutely insane. So that's one. He's been banned from Australia, I believe. I mean, he's a 17-year-old man in a flat on Isle of Wight writing books. I mean, that shows to the level he must be, they must fear him. And obviously they're using the whole kind of anti-Semitism without actually knowing that it means a group of languages. Um, they, they use a blurring word. So, yeah, that's happening everywhere. And I think people... In general, regardless of what this, the bigger picture is, Ryan was saying that this is the social credit. This is your social credit. Your social persona is what's going to allow you to earn a living. So if any of these allegations happen or anything similar to anyone who says the wrong thing, your social credit score will go down. You won't be able to earn a living. This is happening in China. And I think people need to understand that this is just an example on a grand scale of what can happen. And it's going to start happening a lot, lot more. And we've seen it with Farage as well. So there's so many elements to this as well. It's happened with David a long time ago. Um, and he carries on writing and he's, he's tours doing really well at the moment in England. Obviously, can't go out of it. Um, but it's it's happening. And people need to realise that people like David have been telling us that it's been happening for a long time. And how many do we have to tick off the list before we go... You're saying that consp you've swapped the word journalist for conspiracy because you theorist because you don't agree with me. And when you agree with me, I'm a journalist. And when you don't agree with me, I'm a conspiracy theorist. And that is basically what we're coming down to. And that's the path um, that the partisan split there. And if you're going on the conspiracy side, you're going to get demonetized. You're not going to have to earn a living. And um, that's where we need to be worrying. This is going. And the timing of this with the... Um, the speech thing going through Parliament, the um, online censorship thing, I don't think is a coincidence in any way, shape or form. I do think, as you say, it's compartmentalised. Brand wouldn't. I think he's gone in there. I may have done what he's done, but also he's been used. Several things can be can be um, true at once. And I think when you look at the checkerboard and that symbology, they want you in black and white thinking, good or bad. Actually, he may be, have done some bad things in a bad system, tried to get out and it's too late. People need to stop thinking this di dynamic kind of extremes and they'll want to push us all to the extremes and it'll be the left that's really, at the moment, the woke lot that will be allowed into their smart cities. And this is how far it's going. We'll all have to live in the woods. I don't mind living in the woods with you guys. That'd be fine. But, like, this is where it's going and there's been this has been told for 30-plus years. It's not accidents. Conspiracies happen every day all the time you wouldn't have a detective if conspiracies didn't happen there'd be no work that's the whole point so mm -hmm. conspiracies happen all the time and i think we need to get over that so there is probably conspiracies happening here but also it doesn't mean he's innocent either eric we're getting asked by viewer jake if this is a coordinated hit job then by whom and for what purpose <sighs> well um God, it could be a lot of people. I want to push back a little bit on the Rumble thing, by the way. Because, and I'm not trying to defend them. There's obviously concerns. David Sachs is a major investor, Silicon Valley ties, all that. However, a publicly traded company is automatically within a target of a BlackRock. So if you're publicly traded, BlackRock can buy. Big chunks of you can influence you. Them's the breaks when you're publicly traded. Um, now, conspiracy, hit job. Well, let me see. What has he been speaking out about? He's very uh, anti-Ukraine situation. He's a very WEF, all these things. People are going, how is it Rupert Mur Murdoch would work with Channel 4 when they're completely differently aligned politically? Well, I don't know that they are necessarily. And I can say Rupert Murdoch has no love with any message that Russell Brand has been spouting about as far as I know. So, hey, you know, if we have two competing sources here, then you also have the old media versus new media. I'm going to throw a weird name out there, PewDiePie. How many times have we seen this YouTuber from Sweden, PewDiePie, get thrown under the bus by Wall Street Journal, Rupert Murdoch, by the way, and others because he's huge. So this is going on in behind the scenes, I feel. When you have a force like Russell Brand with six million plus, whose videos get hundreds of thousands, more viewers than Fox does at night, than MSNBC, than any of the networks on either side of the pond, per video every day, this is a, a fundamental fight for survival. Over to Ryan. 
Yeah. I mean, just to go off on that same question, you know, it's, 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 uh, we're obviously would be guessing, right. I mean, it's really it's like, he, like Eric pointed out, there's the million directions that could go in, but it seems m most logical. Like I would point out, for example, that he, the biggest channel I can see on YouTube he has has been there since 2007. So there's kind of this overlap right now that he kind of like became this new person and was like speaking the truth. He, he's been doing the channel work for a long time, you know? And so the question is, if this is about his content, what was it in the recent surge? And I think that's an interesting point that we could, you guys can look at his channel and you can see a lot of the stuff he was talking about. And I think that that, you know, some of the most recent topics hit, hit nerves with a lot of people. And my, my gut would tell me that what brand was doing, just again, my opinion, I can't verify that what he was doing was just whatever he thought was important. I don't think he's invested as, as much as some of us may be in the larger agenda, like in regard to like seeking out the truth and exposing it. But nonetheless, you like like Eric's pointing out, when you have that kind of reach and you and you're not again, not saying I know this, but in the case, you, if you're not controlled by the people that would at least like to be able to influence your direction, that's uncomfortable for certain people in the world that are very, you know, the narrative managers. And let's not, we're not, this is not conspiratorial. We should get like, like what Richard's saying, we need to get past that mindset. These are very real proven concepts of people that let's just pretend they're doing it for a greater good. They really exist. And they very much try to control the way we view things. It would make sense to me that they would try to, you know, either take him out, which I don't think that's what this looks like. If, if he, you know, kind of no toes, I think they'll just kind of, it'll go away and it will drift away and he'll kind of go forward if that's what this looks like. But again, it's all kind of hypothetical. I think one point to add is that it, the reason this seems so false to me, and I don't even know how, which way I really mean that, just that there's something behind this that doesn't add up. The mainstream media and all this has gone, well, they have for a long time now, but really clearly with this, very tabloid with it. Like they're even past like the allegations. They're going, look, he shared a mean picture about Katy Perry, you know, and everyone's like, this is a mainstream article that came out today or that he bounced this woman on his knee during the late show or something. And it's like, these things are meaningless unless you have the context that he's a sexual pervert, but that's not even proven. So like they're taking steps into the story without some, you know, same point we made in the beginning. So all of this feels very disingenuous to, in my gut. So that's what I would say. And I would argue it's largely because he probably said things that people didn't want. They got a little bit too, too much reach ultimately but that's just an assumption thanks ryan i can see richard's ready to add to that i guess it the disingenuous is is the um the main thing and i think that's something that <clears throat> excuse me is that we all have is this common understanding of when someone's lying to you when someone's manipulating and using you and that's what the mainstream media don't really seem to get and i think that's fostered as someone i, I did it on the screen film with dv production um i went into the mainstream for a little while to see what it was like. I saw it. That was what the type of people they were looking for. And they fostered it in young people. Um, and this was, what, 12, 15, 13 years ago now? So it was there then. So it's been fostered for a long time in these young people. So, um, yeah, I, I agree with everything that Brian says, is, is that he has got such a huge reach. Maybe he was in and he wanted to get out. And once you're in, you can't really just, just get out. Um, but, yeah, it's very disingenuous. And I think that's a really good way of, of putting it. Some people, we feel that there's something not right here. I saw an article today of them saying he did Kundalini, Kundalini yoga. And that is... Um, and now if you do that, that's been connected to being a R word and being in a cult. And it's like, come on, this is this is um, poor. This isn't journalism. This is just poor. That was the insider. And then when you look into the insiders, um, who owns them and their owners and their owners, again, it leads back to BlackRock and Vanguard, as everything does BlackRock, the connotations, obviously, of Saturn as well. Um, and we have a cult behind this and all of this occult symbology is there as well. I actually realized in the watching the program, they do a pan shot, a weird pan shot. And for no apparent reason, unless I'm missing this, there's a horned goat head on his sofa. I mean, what? Where does that come from? That's clearly not his is um he's flat so where did they put who keeps a horned goat head on your sofa and then they're going past and then they've got the symbology of the red flower there as well and they're shot in four six so it's supposed to look like it's an old footage that's obviously virgin symbology there and then she's in a red dress well we know the red dress symbology as well so there's little things popped in there when you understand i'm not saying none of this happened i'm really not he could be guilty as anything i don't know but it's worth knowing the way they use symbology in these things to put these information across. Remember, it's Edward Bernays. It's, it's propaganda. Edward Bernays was the great, great grand or great grandfather of um, one of the guys that started Netflix, as was Sigmund Freud. 
these things are purposely designed to push your push a narrative in in some way and if you're not towing the line they'll flip it on you and um i think that's where the disingenuous comes from yes he may be guilty we don't know but it's also this bit of media is also in my opinion very disingenuous as well which leads me to the next question not only is symbology embedded something far more sinister is embedded so many people are aware that In Plain Sight is like the definitive expose book about Jimmy Savile. There's no copyright on book titles. And they titled the Dispatches episode In Plain Sight and then clickbaited the discussion with Savile, which does look horrendous. I'm not taking away from that. It's, it's disgusting what was said. But it was six years before Savile's crimes were revealed. And I'm wondering... Eric, do you think it's fair for them to parallel him with Savile like that? It's a documentary. I mean, I've given up on documentaries a long time ago, honestly. Uh, I'm going to circle right back to Marilyn Manson, Phoenix Rising documentary. Highly encourage you guys to watch it. It's the same hit job, same principle. You find the thing about the person and use confirmation bias to get you the message you want. So Russell Brand is kind of a yogi guru looking guy. He projects that image. So let's have some cult connotations. Marilyn Manson's a very creepy, scary guy. Well, everybody can visualize that he's going to get into S&M, very hardcore things. These tricks work. Um, are they fair? Are they not? Again, a documentary. I, I would I would love to parse it out and say, is it based on a true story? Or are they going to claim that it's 100% true or what? I would love to see the um, fine print on what they're doing. Because obviously, they're delivering the narrative. They're going to cherry pick who they have on. They're going to not have other people on. And I think they may be harming themselves. I think a lot of people are on to the fact that, well, wait a minute, that, that thing with Savile. Okay, let, let's just take this for a second. He is a shock jock, from what I understand I've seen, not that different than Howard Stern. And if there was rumors about Jimmy Savile, th there's a crude form of humor where he could have said, yeah, I'm going to send you my assistant, ha, 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 because, of course, he probably knew about John Lydon and all that bit. And people would be laughing hysterically. Is he really doing it? Did he actually send his assistant to go show up for Jimmy Savile, or was this an on-air prank in poor taste? Those are the questions. Yeah, Ryan, do you think that the comparison to Savile actually detracts from the program? Because the program has received over 100 complaints. Channel 4 have received those complaints stating that the viewers felt it was unfair. Well, yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, it's, it's, again, it's rooted in things that nobody else can verify and you know, not to make it about the fact that corporate media in a general sense has a, I mean, really, really, really poor reputation, even with people that seem to watch them. So it's really not hard to grasp that they could have manufactured or overlooked to make this like, like Eric is saying, like to, you know, like documentaries. It's funny. We can even discuss that. That's like, is it based on a true story? Documentaries are supposed to be inherently truth. That's funny that we have to even parse that out. But the idea that, you know, it, it, they would do that. Let's put it that way. But I think what's interesting to me about the Jimmy Seville point, I agree with what Eric is saying that ultimately you could see that it he, from his perspective, it may have been a crude joke, definitely in poor taste. And, and that doesn't therefore mean he's some kind of sexual predator. But I will point out that that's a creepy thing that we should highlight kind of independent of the story, sort of like the okay. Epstein thing. Like we all knew it's like, so what he's essentially saying there is he knows and everybody else knows enough to laugh at the fact that by saying, we'll send my assistant that it's kind of creepy kind of joke because, oh, Seville's that creepy <clears throat> sexual predator. So that shows you the kind of open secret of a lot of this stuff. And that's one of the reasons why I'm like, well, it's certainly possible that he could have done these things and nobody said anything till now because that's how this industry works. And we've seen that repeatedly. But at the same time. Again, I think it's taken intentionally out of context with at a time when we haven't proven anything, you know, all of these different uh, uh, little parts of this. And I mean, I'm not going to say that we shouldn't. Again, the police should investigate. And if it shows fruit with something more than that and they find validity in what they're saying, then go forward with that. But everything else from there is just people guessing at what's happening. And I think that's, you know, irresponsible. Ultimately, I want to push the chat. Richard, real quick. So, somebody claimed that I was saying um, Savile was a shock jock. Absolutely not. 
I said Russell Brand was right. a shock jock like Howard Stern. Just right. wanted to clarify. That's how I took it. Richard, do you think tying in Savile diminished the credibility of the show? Yeah, I absolutely do. Again, was that done on purpose or was that done to eventually just kind of bring the whole thing down? It, it, there's so many holes in it. How can you spend four years working on something like that? And I'm not saying it was awful, but it was four years working on something like that. It, you sh it should be far more airtight than than what it was. And, and little things like that undervalue and cheapen the information when you can let it speak for itself. Like we said, there was people they contacted that give glowing reviews to, to dating brand they never included any of them and even i said that to andrew o'neill of all people and he came back saying oh, that's a bizarre concept what to put the information that you've investigated into a show and let the audience decide how is that and that's the mentality of the mainstream media unfortunately this is a man at o'neill who's been around it a long time and that's foreign to him as a supposed journalist to put the information that the investigation has brought up naturally so it's not a natural you're, you're cherry picking it so use titles like that it cheapens the whole thing but then if we come out and talk about Savile and then we go and go well he would seem to be best friends with Prince, uh, King Charles didn't he I'm um, hanging around there for quite a bit was going to be a godson godfather to one of the one of the kids oh no we can't talk about that we can't talk about that but we'll put the folk we're trying to connect the two with one tiny comment that was in uh, 20 or 10 years ago whatever it was that is important to the mainstream media, but the fact that, that a child procurer of that magnitude was around not only the king, the kids, the family, he was attached to most people in this country, the police knew what was going on, most people knew what was going on, the BBC have a, have, have a statue by Eric Gill on the front that they projected the Queen's head onto when she died, as if he was holding it, she was holding it. None of this stuff gets spoken about but a one little comment and we need to understand that these people are absolutely insane. And the ones at the top who actually know what they're doing, these young girls that, that, that did this documentary, they're probably very nice people and absolutely believe in what they're doing, but they don't yet know, in my opinion. And I think we could be, even as people that do this need to kind of comprehend that we'll, we're all being controlled in some sort of way um, to put certain information out. We absolutely are. And they will be useful to them right now. Now, if he comes out, he's um, he's actually innocent of all this. What do you think is going to happen to those filmmakers? They'll never work again. They don't care. They're cannon fodder. So I think I we agree. all need to understand that that we probably, but not 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 into the, the level I don't think that they are now. But what I'm saying is the fact is that we all are being used in this, this way. And we need to understand that it's a very small minority that will pick on something small like that. And then completely ignore the fact that the King of England was best mates with, G with Jimmy Savile. It's insane. Good point. We're going to bring Eric Hunley in for closing observations. Cause he's got to go. Oh and we're going to replace him with Charlie Robinson. Hmm. All right. What, what's um, your closing um, thoughts, Eric? Okay, well, I'm just going to follow up on what Richard was saying, and I think it's kind of all together. Journalism anymore, quote unquote, isn't necessarily intended to be a conspiracy, but you're coming out of elite institutions like Columbia, et cetera, and who are being hired for newsrooms, who are being hired for the networks, the same people who have the same insight and the same beliefs of those who are there, this causes an echo chamber, so therefore this is going to repeat just like any other history, it doesn't necessarily repeat, but it will rhyme. Thank you very much, Eric. Eric's links are in the description box below this video, as are all the guests' links. So please support their important work. Check out his channel. He covers lots of fascinating stories over there. And we'll bring in my fellow uh, hurlers headed Charlie Robinson now. Let's, let's get See him. Ya. Here we go. See you, Eric. See you. How dare you, Sean? Hey, Charlie, what's your opening thoughts on the Russell Brand situation? Well, they got him. They got him, right? <laughs> they found him. They saw. They cracked the case. They found the guy who's responsible for all the bad things in the world. Thank. It was right in front of our eyes the whole time. It was Russell Brand. <laughs> They're like Scooby Doo pulled the mask off. It's Russell Brand. Oh, we loved him, but he's a dirty pedophile, maybe rapist, who did all these things. Oh, where's the evidence? We have it. Believe me, but. It, it's too sensitive. We don't want to show it to you. It'd be shocking. 
Oh, no, no, I'm ready for it. Show me everything you've got. No, 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 it's fine. It's fine. Well, we'll we're going to withhold that. Mm, it's the media being the media. You know, and listen, I don't know. I don't know Russell Brand. I don't, I've, I've never met him. Um, I know who he is. I know I've seen the pictures from before, you know, the one eye stuff and all that. I Listen, I get, don't love that, of course. Don't love that. But lately, he seems to have pivoted into talking about other things. And these are very inconvenient things that for the establishment. So I, I understand what's happening. Um, I'm not going to, you know, I don't, none of us were there. We don't know the ins and outs of what his personal life was. But we do know how the media operates. And we do know a coordinated attack when we see one. This is the Alex Jones debanking. This is, you know, the, there's plenty of of, of, of previous uh, opportunities where we could, we could talk about, we've seen this happen. A coordinated attack. All of a sudden, first of all, nobody was talking about it. And then in one day, everybody's talking about it. And what does David Icke say? How can you tell when it's the agenda when it's nowhere and then all of a sudden it's everywhere and it's everywhere. So he's they're, they're giving him the they're giving him as as the I, I mean I hate to I hate to sort of uh, quote the the Tate brothers, right? But but like they're giving him the matrix treatment. Matrix attack, right? He 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 is he is he came into the system and he's saying things that are very inconvenient and they can't have that and he's very likable. And they're not the media is not likable. Nobody likes the media. Who did name somebody in the media? You go, I hate the mainstream media, but that guy's great. I can't think of anybody. People like Russell Brand. He seems genuine. I don't know him. It could be all be a gigantic act for all I know. Whatever. But he appears to be genuine, and he ha he's talking about the things that people want to hear about and that, and that a lot of people don't know about. They didn't know about this. So he is a conduit. He he is a he is somebody that is he is grooming. He's grooming a whole new generation of people to be distrustful of the media. That's for sure. So if if he's guilty of grooming, he's gr guilty of that for without any question. And they they can't have that. So so I I'm I'm you know again, I without knowing the details, it's hard to say what's what, right? And and we all try to be as 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 honest about this as we can but i don't need to see the details to recognize a coordinated media attack when i see one i know what they look like this is one of them right it's undeniable so so he's going to get the treatment and then and then they'll move on to somebody else because they're parasites they're locusts they come in they destroy everything and then they move on to somebody else right so somebody else will get it next so I'd just like to add to that then that we're not detracting from the seriousness of the allegations here because a lot of people in this country have judged him already and think the things he's done, even if it hasn't crossed into the R word, are really despicable and miso misogynistic. And I'm going to bring some questions in from those people just so we can analyze that side of it as well. So I'll put this one over to you first, Ryan. Um, Neil is saying that would you be happy if your 16 year old daughter started dating a 31 year old man and he was taking her out of school that is not normal behavior well no but are we assuming that's what happened with russell brand because he doesn't know that i don't know that nobody here knows that you know so i, I these kind of conversations we, my point being is that every single one of these people are anonymous right now we can't verify any of this stuff i mean I, as of the current reporting i was seeing this morning so uh, obviously but see not to I understand the question, right? But it's not a fair question in the context of what's going on right now because nobody's going to be okay with that. I mean, I, I, we talked about this yesterday. Regardless, I, I think as you said earlier, Sean, regardless of whether it is the legal age of consent in the UK, I can objectively say I find that disgusting. I find that to be inappropriate. My point, though, is that most people would be uncomfortable with that. But until we know that's actually what happened, not just through anonymous reporting, the mainstream media says, trust me, I'll tell, I'll, I have the receipts, but I can't show you, then we shouldn't pretend like that's the case. That's, this is the public, the court of public opinion. And we just have to stop allowing them to play us that way. You know? and, and really quickly off of Charlie's point, this is what I was saying about the machine, like the parasite side of this, is there's two aspects to it. Well, there's a lot of aspects, but in the, in the context of that point, there's two aspects where 
you know, part of it could be a weaponized agenda to take him out because he's telling the truth. But whether that's even the case, the parasite aspect he's talking about happens regardless, like with a political scoring points level. Brand is seen as this right wing commentator. So if they can take him down a notch and scare other people from doing the same thing, they'll take advantage of that, whether or not they even care if it's true. That's the kind of parasite mentality I think that that Charlie was pointing at. At least that's what I saw it as. And I think that's important. So, Richard, I think we are all genuinely disgusted by the allegations. When we watch that show, it really hits you in the guts. And you think if these things are true, this is really immoral and some punishment must be handed out. So what do you say to the people on that side of it who are calling us into question because we're giving the other side of it as well? There's kind of a reaction out there. If we're giving the other side of it as well, if we're saying it looks like this has been co-opted to shut him up, then we are saying that, when people are speaking out about these horrible crimes, we're trying to silence their voices. Well, what I'd say to them is that, that again, it's balance. It's you need two sides. If they'd have done this in the documentary, you wouldn't be having to do it ourselves. It's as simple as that. If the mainstream media did their job, you wouldn't need an alternative media. It's, it really is that simple. We're providing the counter narrative to what they should be doing as journalists so when someone cut they contact him well like they did with this this young lady and she gives a glowing review of how nice he was and how decent it was and they've contracted a hundred people bear in mind and they've found five people that that, that have, have got allegations to them they should be at least acknowledging that in a way in the in the content in the investigation and in the reporting so then you can make up your own decision, but they're not. So when that's what we're doing. We're providing, we're doing half the job that they should be doing. So we're not saying he's innocent at all. What we're saying is that one, it's not gone to court and any adult with a, with an adult mind would understand what, what, what the process is for these things. Um, and we're saying that anyone in the future that gets accused of things that, that there should be, this, you should not have a channel Four documentary made about it. It should go to, to the police we're just using logic. I mean, these are things that common sense things. We're not saying he's not guilty. We're just saying that, that this is absurd thing to do and put it in that context. And clearly it's to, to ruin the man, regardless if he's guilty or not. Um, that's just common sense. So um, you can still take all the information and as a grown adult with your own grown responsibility, go, it still sounds like he's guilty to me. You can ignore everything. You're an adult. Take responsibility for your own understandings, but you should have the you should have, in my opinion, um, the access to all information so you can make your decision. And that's what they're trying to take away from you. And that's what we're standing up for. We're not standing up for Russell Brand. We're standing up for the right for people to have the information to be able to make a decent decision about how they live their lives and the way the world is. That's what we're standing up for. And for our children in the future, be able to question things, question everything. Because if we don't stand up for it, especially in the age of the Internet, our children will not be able to question everything because your social credit score will get dipped and you won't be able to go to college and you won't be able to go to school and you won't be able to get on the bus. And if you think that ain't happening, it's happening in China already. So we're not standing up for Russell Brand. We're standing up to to your for your freedoms. This is just one of the many cases. So it's not about Russell. It's not about that. It's about you having access to the information and being able to make up your own decisions based on all the various outcomes and, and um, ways of looking at things. You're a grown adult. You should be able to be treated like one. So I'm going to read this comment. It, it's not a coordinated attack. Why are they attacking other people such as Schofield in the same way? If it is a coordinated attack, then they attack their own as well. It will be someone else next. And what we're seeing here is that the same corporate and media entities that monetized his misogynistic jokes and you know paid him to host these shows and behave in this extreme way have now turned on him so how can they you know how, how could they do that let's go over to ryan I, I think it goes back to the same point that it's from from the I've always pointed out the people in the corporate media level, you know, the, the, the Don Lemons and the people in that position. I personally don't think they know anything of what's going on. Like these people are allowed to think they're in the know, but are really limited in understanding what is really going on. And so most of these people, I would argue, aren't really in this for the end game of actually, you know, synthesizing the truth from what's going on. So, you know, it's, it's, it's clear as they would take this action, like I was saying before, because he is a 
political enemy because the Alan, you know, like going back to like the Kavanaugh conversation, right? Remember what they were screaming then? Believe all women. It wasn't about let's find out the truth. It was believe them first. And that's that's the kind of mentality we're seeing here yet again, is that, you know, like like the question from before. Nobody here is trying to say that we think this or we think, well, at least I'll speak for myself. I'm not saying I think this or I think that. I'm saying let's be objective. Let's stand back like, like Richard is saying and realize that we don't have all the information. So you can feel free out there to come to your opinion. Just don't pretend that means that you know for sure. That's just your opinion. Everyone out there is throwing their opinions around as if you're allowed to have this one but not allowed to have that one. And that's, that's what that question was. Like, you know, in a general sense, people are acting like by literally discussing whether or not the alternative might be true is somehow taking away from their allegations. That's not even remotely honest. Like we know that's not true. Objectivity is honest, you know, and that's what we're really trying to hash out here. So Richard channel four was one of the very organizations that was paying him to behave the way that they are now calling out. How can they justify that? Because they just don't care. Quite frankly, they don't care. They just don't care what you think about them because they'll just do it anyway. People like people like so I've looked into this as well. So uh, the Guardian gave it five stars, by the way, the documentary. And this may be life. So the Guardian would give it five stars, considering that the Guardian chair, um, Charles Grass, I've probably butchered that name, um, was the chairman of Channel Four at one point, the CEO of of um, Guardian at the moment, and a Bateson worked for YouTube, Google, and is listed in the Reuters, Reuters Institute for Journalism. Um, and Reuters own shares in ITN who produced that, who produced the news for Channel 4. So you have to understand that these people are swapping from one business to the next. But the fact is they don't care. And I think most of them, as, as Ryan says, they believe they're actually doing the right thing. I don't think these are bad people. They're so far on the totem pole. Um, I mean, we're not even on it. Um, we live in the woods and that's where we'll stay. But they they are so far down that they don't know how they're being used. Once at the very top, like the ones that you'll never hear of, the ones that are funding these things through BlackRock and Vanguard, because you don't know where the money's coming from into there. They're the ones that just don't care. They won't care. Of course they won't care. You just appeal onto them. They see us as ants, and we know that. They're psychopaths. So they don't care if, if they'll put that out. That's what needs to be done then. And and I think there's people at Channel 4 will be going, hang on a minute, we were doing that last week. We were doing the weird show with the people with their knobs and bollocks out. Am I allowed to say knobs and bollocks? said it twice now. Um, on on the, in the, wouldn't they, that, that weird show where they were all naked and I believe there were kids there. Like, how can you take any moral standing and work on that show and think that you have any moral standing? You, it's mental. But they've got no mortgages to pay. They've got um, kids to look after. They've probably got their mortgage through BlackRock or Vanguard. So you know what I mean? They're, they're not bad people. They're just caught in a system that's totally corrupt. It's like, don't play the ha hate the player, hate the game. The game is just messed up and it needs to be brought down. And I think it is, Sean and um, Brian, I think it's, it's, it, it's desperate. These are the signs of a desperate system that's in its, it's like throwing its arms around because look what they're throwing at us all the time. You've got them putting aliens out one week. Climate change are all going to die from climate boiling the next week. Then it switches over to the E guy that we can't announce and how him and his island, but we'll ignore the book. And then we come back to um, talking about Russell Brand and while they set up the next bit to come back to you, Les, and keeping us all in smart cities. They're desperately throwing things at them because after the Rona, they, um, they, they played their big card and they woke way too many people up. And they've even tried that again recently, and that's just gone... So I just think they're desperate, mate. And um, I think they don't care. They're struggling for air at the moment. Charlie, can you hear me okay? Are you good? Yeah, I had to reset my internet. Sorry, guys. Hey, no worries. Okay, so Julia is wondering why the women did not go to the police. That's one of the viewer questions. I'll put that to you, Charlie, but let me just add a bit to that then. So the normal course of events is, you know, if something happens to someone, if they're a young person, it may take many years before they feel ready to not have to relive the trauma to take that to the cops and then the cops do an investigation and the legal process goes from there but in this case what we've seen is four-year investigation they said that he was sleeping with 90 100 women per month one of his staff members on the show even said she's witnessed five a day over a 10-year span that's over 10,000 people so do you think the way they've gone about this then to find four people that never went to the police, they've combed over his life, 
do you think that adds less credence to the case they are putting forward? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's so it's such a sensitive topic, too. You know, I mean, you don't want to be wrong about this, right? You don't want to dismiss somebody that's that is is telling the truth, right? But be this is not something where you should be quick to you know say that he's guilty until proven innocent. Like I need to, we need to see all the evidence. If there's evidence of this, throw the book at him. By all means, hammer him. But if there's not and there's and this is, you know, an it, a case of somebody that didn't have, you know, the relationship in their mind was one thing and in his mind it was something else. That happens quite a bit. That happens with celebrities, all right? There's, there's, let's not discount the fact that celebrities get, you know, they have shakedowns all the time on them by disgruntled partners. So there's that. The whole thing is very messy, but without, I, without the evidence, without the people coming forward and simultaneously with a full media, uh, you know, basically judge, jury, and executioner of him, it makes me very suspicious. Now, if this had happened, again, I, and I'm not trying to, I don't know the ins and outs of somebody going through trauma after after experiencing something like this, if it happened. And so the idea of it taking several years to process this and be feel comfortable t going to the authorities, sure, maybe. That makes sense. I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't know. But it just all feels a little too coordinated for me. And, and again, if the media did, wasn't talking about it, if it was like a story in a news, one newspaper and they talked about it, I'd be like, whoa, this is crazy. Let's hear a little bit. I'd still want evidence. But again, when you have all of the papers on the same day running the same story, it, did they find weapons of mass destruction in Russell Brand's house? Because that's what it feels like to me. You know, I, how many of these, uh, you know, 169,000 dead from the, from the virus, right? Front page everywhere, all at the same time. Okay, this is how they drive the narrative, is with all their captured institutes in the, in the, in the press. And so again, it's like, I'm sorry if I don't automatically believe all women, as we were told to believe all women a couple of years ago. I'm sorry if I don't default to that. That's craziness to, to, to have that. I'll tell you what, whether you're a man or woman or whoever claiming whatever, a sexual assault or, or anything else, you want me to believe you? Show me. Show me the evidence. Show me, the, show me what you want me to believe. Otherwise, we don't have anything to talk about. I just, I just, I, I just don't believe that that the media all decided that they're going to look out for the best interest of by all get going after one guy on the same day in a coordinated fashion. I've just seen this too many times. It's, it, it, it stinks. It stinks of the media. What do you think about that, Ryan? Well, I would add to, and I, I agree with everything Charlie said, <clears throat> but I would add to it though. There is a dynamic that should be considered that there is a time where there would be somebody, especially when this is exactly the dynamic, let's just hypothetically say this is the way it happened, a very powerful, very rich, very influential person who has the ability to do something to where all you're ultimately left with is, this happened to me. That happens, right? So we should consider that somebody would be left in a position where they have no evidence. And then we should at least, my point is it shouldn't be dismissed just as likely, just as much as it shouldn't be blindly accepted, regardless of the level of evidence, right? I think right. we could all agree with that. So I think right. that ultimately, going back to your question, you know, why would they have not gone to the police? I think getting even getting into those kind of questions is prelim. Is, is, it's, we're, it's too early, you know. We like we're all saying we don't have enough evidence. We don't know what we can prove. So then we're getting into trying to like almost disparage whether or not they made the right choices before we even know what actually happened. You know, I would actually, if I would pivot it more to say. If this is ultimately the truth, why didn't the reporters bring this to somebody's attention before now? And this has been going on for years. So your ultimate point is to make sure that you could get the story the way you like it. You allowed a, a sexual predator to continue doing that. <laughs> that doesn't seem like a very moral thing to do. So, yeah, I mean, again, it, it, we don't know. And I think the reality is we can obviously see that they're using this in a way to push an agenda based on something that they're ch seemingly choosing to not show people. That seems that screams dishonesty, right? But we should see it fleshed out. Like, that's why I kind of think the ultimate point should be allow the police to go forward with this and let the cards fall where they lie. But the point is we're already choosing to make decisions about this from, from 
financial levels, from corporate levels, from, you know, things that influence his life and people around him. And that's no matter what now at this point, that's inappropriate. Over to Richard. Obviously, okay, a, a really good point there, Ryan, to be honest, is that why in the four years didn't they support these young girls with going to the authorities? You go, okay, we've got a team around you, a team of support here at Channel 4. We've got lawyers. We can help you go to the police and we can do this the right way. Then we'll make a film about it. Right. That's the way around it should have been done. That's the way around a, a, a com the common sense way would have gone. We will support you to get justice. And whilst we're getting justice, we might we'll make a film about it. And after we've gotten justice, we'll release it. And if we don't get justice, we can release it and say how we didn't get the justice we thought we were. That's what documentary filmmaking is about. You you, you create you don't create. So you do the opposite. You you have something happen in the world and you cover it and then report on it. What they've done is manufactured something and then got the result. They, they've got the, so they've created the problem, they've got the reaction and the solution will be Brussels brand is this and the, the um, conspiracy theories are dangerous and everybody should be taken off um, online that, that speak out against the mainstream media. That's the solution. It's a Galian dialect. So my opinion is they'll have individual understandings of why they didn't go. That's not for me to comment on. I have I wouldn't know and, and God bless them. But there was a system there at Channel 4 that could have helped them go to the police and supported them through that before they make a film. You've put your film in front of the people that you think that you're, that you're protesting to support. You've created a film first in before you've gone, you've supported them going to the authorities. What sort of mental world do we live in? That doesn't make any sense to me. If you're if you're telling me you care about these women, you don't. You care about your film, and that's disturbing to me. Unless I'm completely mental and that's backwards, but that sounds about right to me. Right, we've only got a few minutes left, so I'm going to just have one last question, and then I'll let you guys tell the viewers where they can find you and support you online. So, Charlie, in the last couple of days, we've seen allegations against Tim Ballard. We've seen allegations against the producer of Sound of Freedom. Has this become the modern day lone gunman strategy? Sure. I mean, it's it's um, it's a show trial for your character, judge, jury, and executioner. This is, you've been found guilty in the court of public opinion. You're you've been canceled. Now, again, when they throw these allegations at you, it, if they're not true. It would be despicable, but it wouldn't be the first time. But but again, you you have now stained somebody with this. The, the, you, you can't put you can't talk about this sort of thing with uh, and attach a person's name to it and have them go through all of this and then go up. Oh, whoops. Mistakes were made. You know, like Rumsfeld would say, oh, mistakes were made. We're charting a course forward. We're not going to worry about the past. The past is you just destroyed somebody. You just destroyed their character on false allegations. Now, if they're false, I think that the media should be held accountable for this. I think the media should be held accountable always, but that's never going to happen. But I, I, it, it's the new, you know, it's funny though, Sean, how, how they pick and choose who they care about. Like everybody in the world knew Harvey Weinstein was up to no good. It was in family guy. You know what I mean? Like don't get in a hotel with Harvey Weinstein. It was an open secret. Everybody knew what Jimmy Savile was doing. Everybody knew what Jeffrey Epstein was doing. You want to investigate them, the media, nowhere to be found. But Russell Brand, Tim Boward come out and they and they they tend to be talking about things that are inconvenient to the empire and all of a sudden they get rape charges thrown against them. You know, I'm sorry, but that just looks really suspicious to me. And I'm trying to be as objective as I can. And I understand that it's a polarizing topic and it's and I want to be sent sensitive to somebody that's actually gone through that. But I'll tell you, this is something that you can use to tarnish somebody's reputation and you don't really need this, right? It's the damage is done just already, right? So what are you going to do? You know, unscrew this? You, you can't. So um, it's a tactic that Charlie, I would expect can, to see more where, and more of. Where can people find you and support you online, Charlie? Sure. Uh, Macroaggressions uh, podcast goes out in audio format everywhere and in video. How about Rockfin? That's a good place. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Macroaggressions. Thanks, Sean, for having me. Good to see you, Ryan and Rich. Thank you. 
huge thank you for everybody's contributions this evening and all the viewers' questions. Ryan, where can the viewers find you and support you? Do I have time to give one last point or just jump to the your call? Go for it. Yeah, we're in a okay. minute, though. Oh, real quick, I just want to add to your point about, you know, think about the jury concept of this. Let's say he is guilty or let's say this goes to trial. What they're doing right now is effectively influencing any level of jury people, you know, jury whatever you would call it, a juror <laughs> in that context. And that seems pretty interesting. And then at what point this goes further for YouTube or other countries or anybody to just create allegations against somebody that they don't like for any number of reasons and how that can be weaponized. I think it's a dangerous thing. Thank, thank you for having this conversation. I think this was a very objective, you know, this was important. So thank you. Uh, the last American vagabond.com is the best place to go for all of our content. TLA vagabond on Twitter and TLab substack.com on substack. Thanks for having us on. Cheers, Ryan. And Richard, where can people find and support you? Um, thank you for having me on, Jordan. It's been nice to chat to you. I think it's been years. I haven't managed to chat to you in like years of watching your stuff. So it's great to, to chat to you and, and see you guys. Um, you can find me on WhatsApp, Rich, on um, on Twitter or X or whatever you want to call it now. Um, Iconic.com is all the film work will be there as well. So you can see my weekly show classified on there every Wednesday evening. And WhatsApp podcast, just put it in, in any podcast searching. And you'll find me and Gaz Ike talking nonsense every week about how mad the world is. And um, <laughs> you've been doing that for about four three years now. It's going well. So thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate it. Thanks, guys, for spending time with us. And viewers, please go down in the description box. You'll see the links to what these guys are up to and support their work. And we hope to speak to you guys soon. So take care out there. Cheers. Thanks. All right. We're going to bring in Stephen Knight now. And we're going to bring in our others. Let's go to it. Here we go. I'm going to hand it over to him. And I'm going to bog off. Thank you, sir. Yes. Bog off. Not heard that in a while. Charlotte, how are you? Sorry, that wasn't directed at you there. In case you just heard, heard that. It's not the first you... time I've heard it, Stephen. Don't worry. <laughs> are you are you braving sitting outside? In, are you in it's the actually conservatory. conservatory. Okay. Uh, so I'm, I'm inside, but outside. I was just saying that's a bold move, considering how you sound like you're in England. So, yeah. Uh, maybe you could just let our viewers and audiences know what you do, what keeps you busy. Uh, aside from a regular job away from the conspiracy truth movement um you'll find me quite active on twitter uh under charlotte m uk um been big well active properly since early 2020 calling everything out um and i pop up on some podcasts the podcast now and then so would you say so you're actually um part or proponent of the the truth conspiracy movement yeah i mean look it's very fractured at the moment so i'm uh unsure as to whether I want to be labelled as that but yeah I mean um, I think 2016 I first started uh, questioning things and uh, listening and watching and reading uh, different things by different people that weren't on the mainstream uh, media and I think from then um, I just wanted to tell everybody all about it and uh, get people to start asking questions themselves. Okay, well, you sound like you spend about as much on you know time on social media as I do. So no doubt you would have seen the buzz leading up to the dispatches program. There was a lot of speculation about who was going to be featured, who would be the subject, a lot of names thrown about. Uh, it was uh, soon figured out it was Russell Brand, and we got a Times article outlining the main accusations that preceded the documentary. I'm assuming you sat down and watched it with the rest of the country? Yeah, I watched it. I must admit, I, I was part of the spec speculators uh, leading up to it, which is probably what they want, really. Um, and, I, and I wasn't surprised it was him. And I, I guess my, my thoughts on that were that, you know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, when we knew him on our, our TV screens and the character he portrayed and all that kind of thing, if the, if the documentary had come out then, you know, we wouldn't be as divided as, uh, in, in our uh, opinions on whether it's true or not. Why, why do you think we're more divided about it now then, coming out in 2023? I mean, it has surprised me um, that some people are just very quick to call him a hero and, you know, it's all uh, it's all to be, for him to be taken down due to him speaking out about the establishment. And I guess 
part of uh, me learning things about how the world worked a few years ago was that there are some shady characters um, that are, are do some shady deeds um, and they get elevated into a certain position. Um, I mean, look back at his relationship, his marriage to Katy Perry. Um, a lot of things I've seen back, back in the day was, that, you know, it's, it's her handler more than anything else. I watched um, a clip yesterday of a, a video I've not seen before, the one on red carpet, and uh, she was, they were get, both getting interviewed and and uh, she got quite giddy, let's put it that way, and he visibly like told her to shut up. Um, and he even held up a little pendant. Rebecca, there thanks for joining us. Said, Sorry, oh, Charlotte. Yeah. So, and then she did shut up and she, and she all changed. So, yeah, there's a, a murky world, and I'm pretty sure he's part of it. How much can we learn from those historical clips? Because you, you mentioned Katy Perry there, who's an ex-wife. She's actually gone on record and outright described him as controlling, and she's alluded to information she has that uh, could be quite incriminating, uh, not necessarily in a, a legal aspect, but certainly would have a, uh, an impact on his reputation that she's kind of holding back for a rainy day, I think she said. And for me, it's, it's difficult to wade through this because a lot of this seems to be potential red flags. Uh, mm -hmm. Much of it seems to be like really laddish, boorish, shock jock jokes, which is basically what he was famous for. And basically, right or wrong, people didn't react uh, as kind of um uh strongly to in the sort of pre me too movement so mm. i mean how much can we glean from these historic clips? yeah i mean th that makes you think as well you know that all these names that were getting brought to the <clears throat> forefront of the me too movement in inverted commas and his name i don't recall being banded about at all so yeah i mean um, I would be very interested to hear what she has to say. I do recall at the time, probably just when I was on the cusp of still being a celebrity magazine reader for my sins, uh, that he explained the reason he left her was because uh, it couldn't stand the vacuous lifestyle that she, she led. Um, which, I mean, you can imagine, imagine that's the case too, can't you? But yeah, there's certainly some questionable things about what she had done in the past and, uh, you know, certain music videos that emulated, uh, I think there was one called Bon Appetit, where she was led um, on a dining table and people were eating into her and that was very much um, in, in a <clears throat> akin to the Marina Abramovich cake uh, party that she had. Do you remember that? Do you know about that? I will be upfront and open open about my very limited knowledge of Katy Perry's career, oh. <laughs> unfortunately, but I'll take your word for it. But uh, just like to welcome Rebecca as well. Rebecca, I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting your opinions on this. Maybe you could just let us know uh, what it is you do before we delve into it. Hi, um, my name is Rebecca Zong. Thank you for having me. And I am an attorney by trade, but I'm a globally recognized narcissist negotiation expert. I have a pretty big YouTube channel. I'm the best-selling author of the upcoming book, Slay the Bully, How to Negotiate with a Narcissist and Win, which is actually just about to drop next week, which people can check out at slaythebully.com. It's already hit number one on Amazon, but it's about to drop next week. Congratulations. Yeah. So are you based yeah. in the States? Based in the United States, Los Angeles. So in LA, and Russell Brand was a resident there for a while, thanks to his uh, relationship with Katy Perry, I believe, and he, he obviously starred in a few uh, big Hollywood movies. I mean, how how aware are, Pete, are the American public of Russell Brand as a personality, as a celebrity, as, as a famous person? Oh, absolutely. Very, very familiar with who he is. I mean, he was obviously in a lot of different movies. He's got a pretty big podcast now. He's a couple of best-selling books. I mean, definitely everybody in the public knows who he is, for sure. Did you manage to get access to the Dispatches documentary? I know it's a UK production, but were you able to access that stateside and watch it? I don't, I'm not familiar with that, no. Okay, so that this is the ex expository documentary about <laughs> Russell Brand. Obviously, there was a Times article to accompany that. It was a joint uh, adventure. Uh, so, I mean, it, your realm of expertise is, is narcissism and I suppose the telltale signs of that. And I suppose people are really keen to hear what your sort of appraisal of Russell Brand is on that front. Would it be fair to describe him uh, as a narcissist and, and what kind of things would give that away if so? So, you know, when you look at narcissism, what a narcissist is, I like to define a narcissist in lay person's terms. You know, obviously there's the DSM-5, which is what mental health practitioners use to determine narcissism. And I 
when I teach people how to negotiate with narcissists, I, I come at it from a different point of view because I'm looking at it from a leverage, from a strategy point of view. So what I, the way I like to define it is more of a lay person's point of view. And this is a person who has no feeling, and I like to emphasize the word feeling, no feeling of value from uh, internally. So they have to get all of their feeling of value from external sources. And it is a legitimate disorder. So if you look at it from, and, and it is a sliding scale, it's, it's, it's a scope, you know? So if at, at the end of the scale is narcissistic personality disorder, all of us probably have some traits or tendencies of it, right? But as you get further and further down the spectrum, you have more and more of those traits and tendencies. But the way I like to define it is this person is doing everything they can to fill this black hole, this void at all times. And it's never going to get filled. It's never going to get filled. So they suck all of everything they can called narcissistic supply to try to fill it. And you might want to fill it too. And so you're left feeling totally and completely empty. And yet they're still starving. They're still needing more, more, more. And so it comes in the form of what I call diamond level supply, which are how things like how they look in the world, their image. So it's, it's the big cars, it's the celebrity, it's the lots of women, it's the money, it's all of that stuff. And then what I call coal level supply, which is like the dark underbelly of narcissistic supply, which is how they manipulate people, control people, treat people poorly. They also feed their ego from that too. But it's a person who at their core actually has a deep sense of shame, a deep sense of pain. And that's why they're trying to do this all the time. And that's why they can't feel anything about you it, and have any empathy for other people because all they can think about is, is themselves. And so it's scarcity to the utmost extreme. And, it, you know, it's this constant need and cycle for trying to fill this void. Okay, Rebecca, there's a lot to go off there. So thank you for that very expansive definition. And I'll, I'll pick your brains in, in a little while about how that might pertain to Russell Brand or some of his behavior for sure. But Charlotte, there's something interesting you said at the start of this uh, this exchange that you were sort of in uh, line with the sort of conspiracy, uh, conspiratory <laughs> truth. Movement. Now, I've seen a lot from that contingent of the internet shall we say and the, the consensus appears to be that like you say Russell, Russell Brand's a hero and this is one big smear job because he's telling the truth about the establishment and represents some sort of threat to either mainstream media the world economic <laughs> forum the new world order. it depends who you speak to really I suppose but I'm getting the impression that's not your viewpoint so what's what's gone on here to make you a sort of heretic to this truth or conspiracy <laughs> movement that you seem uh, aligned with? Um, I guess, I mean, I've never really trusted him anyway. Um, I, do, I find him very unwatchable, always have. Um, don't find him attractive, you know, a lot, a lot of women have thrown, uh, thrown themselves over at him over the years. Um, and I just found him, uh, I, I find the way that he's been elevated to this position. And let's not forget, he had 6.6 .6 million subscribers on YouTube. First of all, being allowed to talk about what he's been talking about is uh, a bit confusing uh, when I know people who were very low level uh, follower accounts uh, saying very similar um you know being closed down having to reopen another one and start again and that kind of thing that's um lots and lots of people that i know that's happened to so i found that suspicious i guess as well back to what i was saying about him being uh <clears throat> in the club so to speak uh and i guess this goes to you as well rebecca because if if this guy is a narcissist with this past uh, which it was, you know, it was a, a known sex addict. That was the headline, wasn't it, uh, for all that time. Is he actually a reformed character who's wanting justice for the world? And, you know, I, I believe he's married now with a kid on the way and a couple of kids. He's, he had like a, a, a festival a few weeks ago, which was all about, you know, health, quite new agey, I guess. 
Um, and so I'm just trying to work out whether or not, you know, it's still one of them, so to speak, and this is being allowed to happen. A lot of people are saying it's to bring, you know, to silence other people who want to speak out against the system, about against Big Pharma, you name it. Or is this just a genuine attack? Um, and, you know, uh, from Channel 4 and the Times newspaper. You take a run at that, Rebecca, if you want. I think that when people are in the throes of addiction, they definitely show traits of narcissism. There's no doubt about that. He said he was a sex addict. He admitted that he was a drug addict. And when you are in active addiction, they, you are definitely narcissistic. I don't know if there's any other types of overlay of, of uh, mental health issues. I don't, you know, I'm not sure, but if there were other types of mental health issues there, then that could also present a problem, you know? So I think what's more concerning is, and, and who knows what his memory is of that, you know, but, um, and, and the, more concerning thing is that the attacks that go on to the accusers now and, and the, you know, what I call um, DARVO, which is deny, attack, reverse, victim, offender. And I don't know if uh, anybody here, if, if you guys are familiar with that term, but it's the number one way that narcissists avoid and evade taking responsibility for their actions. He says, hey, I was horrible during those years. He freely admits all of that, but he doesn't want to take responsibility for this, these actions. And that is what I think is more concerning. He's saying there's just absolutely no possible way that any of this took, took place. I don't know that that's necessarily true. So, you know, what, how narcissists evade responsibility is they deny that it took place. They then turn around, they attack the accuser and they reverse the fact on, the, on them. And then they make it out like they're the victim. Like they're the ones who are being victimized and then they make so much noise around it and they make it, they, they then end up smearing the person who's the victim, like who's the action, make it look like they're the offender as if then I, you know, I'm not saying anything about this or whatever, but you know, who in their right mind would want to come forward and have all of this on them, any kind of accuser. I mean, they end up being persecuted by the press, you know, and, and it, it's a horrible situation for them. So, you know, the fact that they turn around and act like they're being victimized and smear these, these women is, I think, you know, absolutely unconscionable. And, and that's the number one way that narcissists used to avoid accountability. And, you know, so I think, I, I don't know what the, the what's going to end up coming out here. I don't know if he's guilty or not, but I don't like when, when celebrities use their celebrity to turn around and, and then go ahead and smear accusers. And that, that is what I end up having a problem with, especially when it comes to women especially when it comes to women, because I think that it would, if it were the other way around, it wouldn't happen that way. All right. That's, that's a fair point for sure. Charlotte, I just want to take us back to conspiracy town again, if that's okay. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, the idea from many is that Russell Brand is, is probably most, uh, if this is a conspiracy to silence him because of his output on big pharma. Now I'm going to say something deeply unpopular in the chat now, and that's that I don't think he's saying anything new or interesting about big pharma. We've known for the longest time big farmers evil. They put profits before health and, and people. I think uh, Ben Goldacre's book, Big Farmer, I remember reading that, oh, it must have been over 10 years ago. And that kind of output was always a product of the progressive
with mainstream left. It was almost for people who were pushing this idea of socialized medicine for the people and uh, anti-capitalist for sure. Uh, and now Brandy is kind of regurgitating a lot of these tropes in this sort of COVID era. People who are not familiar with this argument before are sort of seeing him as some sort of threat, some sort of truth teller on this issue that big pharma would do well to silence and it just feels like anyone else that's already made these points ad nauseum before he has by a much larger platforms and means haven't kind of faced a, a similar fate so do you think that that conspiracy kind of stacks up in light of that yeah i, I do i definitely do and I, I see that side of it um I mean, I also, like so many people saying it's a distraction and, I, and I, I, it annoys me when that happens. But I must admit, like yesterday, um, Rebecca, you probably don't know, but in Britain, uh, we passed the online safety bill, which was previously called the online harms bill. And there's been a lot of uh, negative uh, opinions from the, the UK public about this and what it, what it could mean. Um, and Stephen, I, I was thinking about the Nicola Bully situation a few a few months ago, where it was just online speculation due to the reporting of something. And I, I, in a conspiracy mind, is this kind of related to that as well? You know, like everyone, everybody's talking about it on, online, whether you uh, uh, agree with him or not. Um, so that's kind of my perspective on, on things uh, at the moment. Sorry, just to clarify, is, is, the, is the implication there sort of this might be completely constructed just to distract us from larger news or people uh, trying that's to... What, that's, not potentially, that's not particularly my opinion, but that's what a lot of people... I did a Twitter space last night and <clears throat> there was a, a couple of hundred people in there and a lot of people think that. There's been a lot of things going on in with the UN in New York and... Uh, the, the sustainable goals for Agenda 2030. And isn't so it, that isn't it just of... more likely there's, a, there's always a lot of things going on on the, on the global I, that, I think so, yeah. I think okay. so, yeah. Rebecca, so I keep trying to push this, I think, and uh, <laughs> I don't know if you're qualified to, to sort of diagnose or give any definitive answer one way or the other but people are, i think would really like to know whether just by obs observing certain behaviors from russell brand the way he operates the things he said whether it could be fair to attribute the label narcissist to him i mean i think that he himself would have said that he was a narcissist you know in his heyday i mean i i don't think that he uh, uh, actually even denies that i think that he pretty much has said that without actually saying that, you know, I think what he wants the public to believe is that he was a hedonistic drug addict, whatever he was at one point. And I think he wants the public to believe that now he is a family man who has two little children and that he has completely changed. So I, I, whether that's true or not, I don't know, but I think that in general, that most of the time, if somebody is a true narcissist, they don't really change. I think that they can get better at hiding their, their traits. I think that they can get better at looking more charming. Remember, narcissists are extremely charming. They're very charismatic. They're very manipulative people. I'm not going to say anything about him personally because I don't know him. But I can tell you that in general, narcissists are extremely charming, charismatic, manipulative people. They're very good at doing what they do. And so I think that at the time, you know, he felt extremely, um, he felt that he was entitled narcissists feel very entitled they don't have boundaries they he he took full advantage of everything you know if you look at the, the the deadly sins of narcissism it's being proud and openly shameless not emotionally bound by the needs of wishes of others they distort everything to filter through their lens they're arrogant they you know they exploit people they use people they don't have boundaries he had every single characteristic of being a narcissist. So whether he continues to have that now, I'm not going to say. But I think that um, it is very difficult for a person to 
completely changed. That is what I'm going to say. All right. Well, this is a question for both of you, and I'll start with Charlotte. Did the people online have been making a lot of assumptions uh, and conclusions based on the fact that these female accusers chose the medium of the press to make these accusations mm. rather than take it to the police and go to the legal system? Is there anything that people are, are fair to read into that at all? Or can you understand the reasons why these women would rather choose that avenue? Um, I'm still kind of on the fence as to what you know what I, what I believe's gone on here. Um, I can understand that money would come into it if they were offered a offered a sum, and they just you know all the, all them years ago when it happened, they just decided to keep quiet. You know, a lot of uh, rape cases among reporters we know, um, and some get tricked out of court, and I think it's quite a high percentage. Um, where the man doesn't get um, done for it, so to speak. And so there's a lot of people saying, why now? You know, this was so long ago, it did happen. Um, but yeah, I think money may come into it. Rebecca, can you read anything into the, the particulars in terms of women, the women in this case going to the press rather than the police? I, I think that maybe sometimes they who knows what their motivations are? I mean, who knows? Maybe they were afraid they weren't going to be believed. Maybe they were uh, concerned about, you know, I, I think who knows what their motivations are. I mean, I think that sometimes they get worried about not uh, the police not taking action because of, of certain things happening. And, you know, and I do want to say, like I said at the beginning, that addicts who are active do have more traits of narcissism than when they are sober and they're in recovery and they are working the 12 steps and they are going through, um, th through the therapy that they need to go through. So who knows with him? But I think that you know, when a, an accuser steps forward and puts themselves, especially when it's several at a time, and puts themselves into a position like this, it's so difficult, especially for women, to put themselves in these positions where they're they're going to be persecuted. At, you know, it's it's an extremely difficult emotional position for them to put themselves in. And, and to say that they're doing it all just for money, I think would be too easy. That's a good point. And keeping on this topic of money, um, Charlotte, uh, you would have no doubt seen the decision by YouTube to remove Russell Brand's ability <laughs> to monetize his, his videos via ad revenue. Do you think that's a fair decision to restrict his ability to earn on the platform due to these allegations that haven't gone through the courts and, and maybe never will? I, I don't think it's fair based on that at all. However, back to my earlier point of him being allowed to be on that platform with everything he was saying anyway, I'm surprised it didn't happen a long, long time before that, um, if it was all genuine, you know. I, and also, I, I do believe that uh, it struck a deal with the platform Rumble um, a long time before that too, so that, that's his main, that was his main focus for a while so um no i don't think it's fair i don't think it's fair that the bbc have also taken down lots of uh footage as well um whilst there's been no real evidence yeah mm. that is interesting it's almost like a memory holding isn't it from the from yeah. the media you know from the bbc specifically is there an aspect of all this that really in a way obviously is will harm his reputation forever but may in, in the long run um help him monetarily if it doesn't go to court i mean his shtick has always been i am bringing the truth to the establishment and in his official statement before the panorama sorry the dispatches uh, documentary rather he was already planting that seed of see look what happens when i get too close to the truth this is what they do is there an aspect of this now where he can turn around to his audience and say look i was right all along and, and figure out how to keep that audience i mean i suppose long question short is this going to have any effect on his loyal audience at all are they going to still maintain that he's some hero targeted by the big state he he's got a cult it's quite it's quite clear that that's the case especially with those who are so adamant that it is uh should be in the clear um i'm pretty sure if you set up a crowdfunding or 
uh, one of the was it crownjustice.com, um, it'll get quite a lot of donations. I don't think I've got anything to worry about in that in that arena. Uh, there's a great question for you here, touching back on what Charlotte just said, actually, Rebecca. Do you believe Russell Brand has a cult leader personality? I think all people who have that sort of celebrity status where people are, are obsessed with a fan like that has the potential to have that sort of cult leader personality where people are swayed and they want they're looking for that magnetic personality to just follow and and have and 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 they want to to believe in that person i think there's always that that danger all right shell and i think you're only with us till uh half seven today so thank you for joining us maybe in the in a couple of minutes me. No, you're very welcome. Maybe in the couple of minutes you've got left, you can just give us your final thoughts on the whole Russell Brand affair and maybe point people towards where they can find more of your content. Okay, cool, yeah. Um, I, I think it's just a case of what, watch this space. The, the story is very, very new. I'm sure I'm going to get more and more people coming out of the woodwork. Um, yeah, it's going to be the story of the year if it isn't already. So, yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at, at Charlotte Emma UK. I'm usually causing mischief over there, so hi, everyone. <laughs> nice to talk to you. Thank you. See you later. Take care. And we're fortunate enough to have Rebecca remain with us. Um, we're going to bring in uh, two more speakers. Hello, Charlie. Thanks for joining us. How are you doing? Hello. Good evening. Good evening. And James, good to see you. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. Good evening. Good evening. Let's, let's start with you, actually, James. So I read your... Um, excellent substack you just released and it kind of really hammers on the this sort of subtitle of the russell brand dispatches uh expository documentary that was you know in plain sight and you really point out and with reference to some of your own historical writing on brand that he was essentially a bit of a creep and the kind of allegations we're hearing now are the kind of things you'd you'd probably expect for somebody of his character uh, would that be fair to say yeah i think so i think I think, well, I mean, the, the more extreme accusations, so the rapes, I mean, you wouldn't, um, you wouldn't necessarily expect that of, of anyone. I mean, but he was always, he was always, he always had a reputation as kind of a sleaze and people kind of were willing to look past it when it suited their kind of ideological agenda. So you had, you know, Russell Brown was, was, you know, initially just a comedian, wasn't really political. Then around 2013, 14, he started to use this word revolution a lot and uh, pal around with people like Owen Jones, for example, who is who was at the time, of, uh, still is like a prominent uh, left wing columnist. And he was kind of, you know, he was Russell Brown was also invited to guest edit the New Statesman. He was taken on current affairs programs such as Newsnight. I think he was on Question Time as well. And he was kind of fated by left-wing kind of lovies if you like and I consider myself very much on the left but it just felt quite it just felt like revolutionist play and it also felt that people were willing to overlook the misogyny of Russell Brand so so you know the, his his ex Katy Perry had had described him their relationship as abusive um Danny Minogue uh the pop star Danny Minogue had, had encountered him and I think had said in a 2006 interview that he was someone who, quote unquote, would not take no for an answer. Um, I think she literally like referred someone. to him as a sexual predator. You know. Yeah, I mean, this this doesn't sound like someone you you necessarily want to bring into the progressive tent if you are, um, you know, if you are the New Statesman, for example, or if you are the Guardian. You know, he was he was regularly asked to write for the Guardian. Um, can and, I just make a quick point about that? I suppose during his height of the sort of on the Corbynite, uh, you know, revolutionary left when he was being, being embraced by the sort of guardians, the new statesmen, the Owen Jones of this world, if there was going to be a conspiracy to take him out because he was threatening the establishment, surely that would have been the time rather than now. Yeah, and I mean, I don't really feel he was a threatening the establishment. I mean, he had a huge you know, multi-million pound mansion in, I think it was the Hollywood Hills at the time, or Be Beverly Hills, and... <laughs> He wasn't offering to, you know, sell that and give the proceeds to the revolution. It was, it was, as I say, rev revolutionist play. And you know, today you see now these allegations have come out. He's he's been on a journey since 2013, 14. This decade, he's been on a journey, and now he kind of associates with some of the people I would basically say fascist, fascist adjacent people. Not all of them, of course, 
Um, but some of those people are he associates with on the internet now, and they've come out to defend him for exactly the same reason as, as the people on the left did a decade ago, because he's he's one of their ideological bedfellows now, so they're willing to look past the misogyny. All right, uh, Charlie, I assume like the rest of us, you were in front of the television to watch the dispatches uh, program on, on Russell Brand. Uh, and if so, did you find it especially compelling? Not particularly, no. I have to be honest with you all. I didn't find it. Uh, it, it didn't pull me in the way that I would think Channel 4 was hoping it might. Um, it's very easy, I find, for people to hide behind anonymity and then make a claim like this because you don't have to put your name to it or your face to it and you can say whatever you want and you're backed up by a massive, massive organisation like Channel 4 and the Times newspaper. So in my mind, if you are a female or a male, but especially because it happens more to women, if you have been the victim of something like this, wouldn't it be more prudent to actually go to the police rather than journalists? This is why I'm sceptical about when men are accused of sex crimes because the women that go to the journalists always are always considered brave, but they're not brave enough to go to the police. Why is that? The stigma of an accusation of sexual misconduct will stay with a man forever. Innocent or otherwise, it will stick. And that's the problem that I have with these types of things. OK, I suppose that's a fairly made point. I mean, is there not an aspect of this? I mean, first of all, I, I would concede that false accusations of, of rape certainly do happen and and are uh, and stigmatising. But I mean, you say that it's easy to stay anonymous and make accusations. And I, I would assume that's actually correct in a lot of situations. But when it comes to sexual assault, is there not a sort of fear from these women that they won't be believed as kind of you just kind of floated because they're anonymous? Maybe they're feeling the system won't take this through to its logical conclusion of justification because it is so hard to get convictions for or maybe they'd fear you know reprisals from Roy russell brand's incredibly passionate loyal fan base things like that and i think as we've seen in you know previous years you know media exposés on the behavior of certain high profile men have actually led to sort of criminal proceedings is there not an aspect of that to consider oh, you're absolutely right on the considerations there because you mentioned something about the system not working in the women's favor if they come out well which system benefits them the police or journalism in my view the benefit would be to go down the legal route and then get the justice that you so seek and you mentioned that the media have uncovered sexual allegations of other celebrities and that have led to, that has led to convictions of those people but there are many instances where the media will sensationalize a story beyond any consideration of innocence and there have been men that have been put on trial, whether it be legal or the media, that have been found to be not guilty. And I can give you a couple of examples. Cliff Richard, the BBC were waiting outside his house before the police even turned up to sensationally break that news. He was found innocent. And a controversial figure, which we all have an opinion about, is Michael Jackson, a, a, probably one of the most famous people ever to walk the earth. He was accused twice of being a paedophile and he was found not guilty in a court of law. But the question still remains. I mean, he, he wasn't. He paid he paid off the uh, the accusers to not take it to court. He paid he, he, he a multi million pounds. In 2005, it was the biggest trial, James. He was found not guilty in that trial. Well, that was one of them. But there were other other accusations. He paid them off. I mean, there was a, net, a long Netflix documentary about this. He, he this paid them off, but he didn't go to court because uh, this, this well, is one. I mean, why would you do that? This is, okay. I know, I take, I take on board your point, and that's the point I'm trying to get across, is that he's such a controversial figure that we all have an opinion of because of the stigma. So the point that I'm leading to is that even if Russell Brand was taken to court and he was found not guilty, how many of us on this video tonight and people watching this will still have an opinion about his innocence or his guilt? So in my view, if a man is accused of sexual misconduct, he should not have his identity revealed until he is convicted of a crime. Would that not be fairer for everybody involved? Potentially, but I suppose, I mean, I would normally trust the justice process, but of course, uh, an innocent conviction in court doesn't necessarily mean the person didn't commit the crimes. I mean, you only have to think of, say, OJ Simpson, for, for example. But you make a great point that I want to put to James about this idea of how we square this circle between giving a voice to the people who have been victimized this way 
and destroying someone's entire career reputation via trial by the, by the media uh, based on some uh, allegations from anonymous people. How, how do we balance this, James? Is, is it a net good that this was printed or should it have been something that should have gone straight to the police and that's where it should have stayed? I think this, there are several points really to touch on. I mean, the idea that, the, that if you speak, I have female friends who've been raped and sexually assaulted in the park. And I, I, I say, you know, the first thing that comes to my mind is, you know, did you go to the police? And it's, it's of the cases I know, it's, it's always been no. And then I, I kind of, you know, I ask why not? And on the one hand, it's because there, there is, there is, they felt that they have felt that there's a culture that they won't be believed. They have felt that there's, there would, there's been a culture within the police uh, where they wouldn't be believed. They felt like the process of going through that would be, be humiliating for them and traumatic to have to go through the process again. They've looked at the statistics of the number of convictions in court for rape, where it's essentially one person's word against another. And those, those just those convicted, the rate of convictions are incredibly low um, and have decided on balance that they want to move on with their life and, and not not put themselves through this. Um, and in terms of the 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 dispatches film, um, I've I've made a documentary with with Hard Cash Productions, who who made who produced this film for Channel Four before, and they are incredibly thorough in terms of who they put up in front of camera for interview, and that's why the, one of the reasons why this documentary and this uh, Sunday Times investigation has been in the works for four years. It's not something that's been just thrown out there like like I, I agree some tabloid newspapers do. They throw out these these accusations against people, and they do have the potential to to ruin their lives and particularly when those accusations involve children so so you know there have have been uh moral panics in the past i think about uh pedophiles um very well satirized by brass eye um in the past but uh, but i don't think that i mean when i when i've made a doc, when i've made documentaries it's been it's it's incredibly hard to get people to 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 go on camera at all um and I can't imagine how hard it is to get someone to go on camera and talk about a traumatic event. So, so okay, being James. I just, I just like, sorry, I just, that, that's a great point. I'll, I'll definitely come back to that. I just want to bring Rebecca in because she's been sat there patiently observing and listening. And you, James, actually said something really interesting that I'd like to get Rebecca's insight on. And it's this idea of a lot of the time it comes down to their word versus his or his versus theirs, et cetera. Now, does that sort of scenario benefit a narcissist rebecca someone who's largely manipulative and charismatic the fact that it's their word versus theirs uh absolutely not and i and just going back to what charlie said as well when you go to negotiate with a narcissist you you and, and i mean any kind of a person who has this sort of mentality you know who's entitled who feels shameless who had no boundaries who fe feels like you know, it was mine to take in the first place. First of all, when you talk about a fair stage, fair for who? Fair for wh in what way? And second of all, I, I know with all of the negotiations that I've been involved with, you have to have some sort of leverage. What leverage would this person have to negotiate with if they just said, hey, I want to come to you. I want to settle. I want a deal. They'd have been like, go away. It never happened. Goodbye. Bye bye. I mean, where would this person have any kind of entree to have any sort of conversation whatsoever unless they were potentially going to be exposing them? Because when you're dealing with a narcissist, their image, that that diamond level supply that I was talking about before, how they look to the world, that's everything. And they will protect and defend that at any cost. And so that image is what is more important to them to protect than anything else. And so when you are going to negotiate with them, having that threat of, of, of their image is, is everything. And so just going to them and saying, Hey, let's settle something. Let's let, you know, you, you know, let's have a conversation about this is, is fantasy land. That's not going to happen. In what world would that ever happen if an accuser comes forward? I mean, and then you're, you know, going to the, the authorities when you're talking about somebody who was, you know, 16 years old and scared and potentially sexually assaulted. And, you know, and you're talking about a celebrity who might have done it and, and asking the authorities to believe her and 
where she was, you know, in a mental state that was potentially, who knows? It, it, you know, it's there's so much involved with that. And why does it always have to go back to the victim should have done this and she should have done this and she should have? It's always back to her and her behavior. And and again, this Darvo thing of reverse victim offender of smearing her, smearing her, smearing her. And then and then it's like back onto this. Well, what's fair? Well, what would be fair? You know. I mean, I just I, ask, Rebecca, is your mobile phone near your microphone at all? It sounds like someone's very keen to get hold of you. Can you oh, I that? don't think so. Yeah, both somebody's. I'll find you. I'll find you. Yeah, I don't. Well, it's my. It's on. It's on by uh, oh. silent, so it shouldn't be. Uh, that's okay. But, okay, but, that's a fair point. Uh, I just want to bring Charlie back in on something because he he has made a good point that true or false uh, or found out guilty or not guilty in a court of law these things essentially end a person's career you look at somebody like kevin spacey for instance completely rejected from the mainstream now he was at the top of his game netflix number one tv show starring in ridley scott movies and all that went away because of some public allegations that he was found and cleared of as uh, not guilty in the courts now he will never get his career back in any similar sense i would imagine uh with Russell Brand, however, it seems like he's been outside of the quote-unquote mainstream for a while now. He, he took a crack at it, couldn't make it, and sort of self-styled himself as sort of an alternative commentator. Uh, will this affect his bottom line in that sense at all, Charlie? The fact that he can just say I, I was right all along and they were just coming for me because I was telling the truths. Uh, is this over for him or will he just only embolden his fan base? I think it probably is over for him. Uh, for what he wanted to achieve. I mean, the YouTube stuff has gone. Apparently that, I mean, looking at what YouTube do to other people that they get rid of, they don't typically invite people back. So that might be over for him on that front. But I think that it will embolden his fans when they say, when he says, you know, this is a, a mainstream media takedown of me because I'm talking about the issues that the mainstream don't want me to talk about. I think it will embolden those kinds of people. I'm not entirely convinced that is the case. But I do see why they would think it, because it does look very much like it's been done in an orchestrated way. And we've seen this already. I mean, earlier on this year, you had the suspension and deletion of um, Andrew Tate from social media, who was done in the same way. You know, it was it was the kind of it was He's done been officially charged with criminal activity, though, hasn't he? He's facing charges. You, you are. You are correct. He has been officially charged, but he's not guilty yet. He's not been found sure. guilty yet. So this is this is where my my line is. I'm not defending anybody. What I'm just trying to get to the bottom of is where do you actually draw the line at fairness? And and Rebecca, you were talking about how you know I get the impression you don't particularly agree with people saying, well, what did the girl do? They should have done this and they should have done that. When you have allegations of this nature, you can't really get much worse than this, other than you know abusing children or murder. I don't think there's anything worse that you can do apart from this in that in that in that vein. So when you say, is it fair on to put the blame on the girl? It's not putting blame on the girl. But if you want to come forward at all, surely the right thing to do is go down the legal route. It's the only way you can't go to a journalist 10 years later and say, oh, something happened to me. But you didn't go to the police. For me, that's a massive red flag. I just want to ask something of James that I, I noticed and really um, identified within his latest Substack piece. And it's this idea that many of us went into lockdown and, and then emerged not long after having spent too much time on, on YouTube, full blown conspiracy theorist about so many things. And that's an observation I've had uh, with various people who I would have formerly considered rather sensible. And I was just wondering if it, if it concerns you at all, James, the fact that as soon as this story broke um, to the world, Elon Musk, without having seen a frame of the investigation, I believe, took to Twitter a platform he owns uh, and regulates to openly state that he thinks this is a targeted, coordinated smear piece on Russell Brand. Is it, is it concerning to you that someone so powerful with so much influence can openly be of that, that sort of conspiratorial mindset without having a single piece of information? Yeah, I mean, what concerns me, I suppose, is it's it's there's a it's a very confused idea of where power actually lies in society. So you have Elon Musk, who's one of the very richest men in the world. I don't know if he is the actually the richest man still in the world who has the power to, you know, as we were reading about just a few weeks ago, turn off the Starlink system that you, the United States Army is using in in Ukraine. 
Um, and yet he believes he seems he appears to believe in this kind of matrix like uh, conspiracy to take people down. I think um, I think COVID, for example, um, I think, you know, lockdown was was pretty traumatic and difficult for everyone. It was not something that I would ever wish to go through uh, again. And I think, yeah, we, we were all spending more time on the Internet. And I think, you know, I'm a believer in Occam's razor. I think the most obvious and simple explanation is usually the, the one that's true. Um, but I think it can be more comforting sometimes to, especially during COVID. I mean, the scariest part was that it kind of makes you feel so small and insignificant as a human being that there could be this pathogen that can just sweep along and we're kind of we're so vulnerable to it and society is so vulnerable to something like that. Whereas it's almost more comforting to think that actually it's just a few of these bad people who are controlling everything, pulling the strings. And if we just do something about them and if we just get together and depose them, everything will kind of be OK. Um, I think that can be um, that that kind of simplistic uh, conspiratorial worldview can be a comfort um, in the same way that some of the old fashioned ideology ideologies like uh, say, you know, I, I was when I was I went through a communist phase as a teenager and it's very it was kind of comforting to see the world in these very simple black and white binaries. Um, whereas when you kind of grow up, you uh, you, you, you hopefully your, your thinking becomes a bit more sophisticated. That's a, that's a great point, comrade. Uh, Rebecca, uh, is it possible for someone of Russell Brand's public status and the things that have now been spread across the world about him in reputable news magazines, sorry, news sources, uh, documentaries, etc., is it possible for him to get fair due process now, or has that been completely tainted by the method by which these allegations have, have come about? I mean, I'd like, I'd like to hope so. You know, I think that everybody's going to have an opinion. Like we're all sitting here having an opinion, right? I mean, you know, I, I would like to hope that, you know, as a lawyer myself and having litigated for a long time and, you know, and I, I have my own uh, book and YouTube channel and all of that, you know, I, I, so I like to talk about these things. And I like to think that justice will continue to be served, that we have you know, processes in your country, processes in, 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 in ours that will look at evidence. And I, you know, I, I like to tell clients all the time, look at evidence, listen to what's being heard, listen to what's being said, and, and let's figure out what's actually happening there. And let's hope that, that, you know, we do come down to the truth and find out what actually is going on. Well, I hope. Just just to put my tinfoil hat on for a second, Rebecca, would it be advantageous for a narcissist to attempt to get slightly ahead of the game if, for instance, they suspected some rather serious allegations were coming down the hill? Would it make sense for them to sort of, you know, spread, spread this idea of they were a sex addict and very promiscuous and had lots of problems, but they're over it now? They were, you know, they're previously a womanizer, et cetera, and kind of, but you know, put this idea of plausible deniability out uh, and then kind of imply people are out to get them because of their content for knowing full well these accusations were coming down the line does that fit into the sort of davo model you were putting forward before a hundred percent a hundred percent sure especially if you're really smart which i know that he is i mean he i actually think that he's a really brilliant guy i mean if you've ever read uh, read any of his writings or uh you know anything that he's said or done i think that he's actually a very very brilliant person but I'm not saying that he manipulated this whole thing because he knew this was coming down the pike. I think that might be, I, I, I don't know. I, 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 that I think that might be stretching it a bit, but you know, I, I, I think that, um, you know, just going back to your question from before, I do hope that, you know, that the court system does what it's supposed to do and find and gets to the heart of what, is actually happening. Charlie, do you think he has any hope of a, of a fair trial now? And I suppose a second part to that question would be, uh, I know these are like quite, sort of like an, a handful of anonymous allegations mm -hmm. now, but typically when somebody's exposed in this way, a lot more people feel emboldened to come forward. Uh, is there a limit to you uh, of people coming forward, perhaps where you'd say, actually, I think there's probably more to this than just, you know, allegation. Uh, so I suppose that's a, a two-parter. I don't, I don't think there's a limit. If if there's genuine accusation, then there should be genuine police inquiry. What we have with the British media 
that have launched this story, I suppose, or exposed this story, is the sensationalism of it all that you don't see against people that have been accused of similar offences even earlier this year. You had the Philip Schofield scandal, you've had the Hugh Edwards scandal. Both of those guys were given a pretty fair uh, shake, in my opinion, compared to what we're seeing today. Because when Philip Schofield came out as gay, he was brave and celebrated, despite the fact that he'd been lying to his wife and the fact that ITV knew about the boy that he's been seeing since. And then but you've none got none of those things were considered a sort of criminal activity. Isn't the main bullet point in the brand <laughs> stuff is that it's very serious? Criminal as a, activity. Yeah, as a parent, rape, isn't it? He's accused of rape. Uh, indeed, indeed, he is. But the what you the problem that I have with some of these stories is that you've got two men who were doing something inappropriate. What Philip Schofield was doing, I'm not going to say what he did was illegal because I'll get in trouble. But if you add up the timeline of all the things that was going on with Philip Schofield, to me, that looks very, very suspect. Then you look at Hugh Edwards and then you see that there's a 61 year old man sexting a, a, a teenage boy for money behind his wife's back. Did those guys get treated as badly, morally speaking, as Russell has been? Now, I understand there's a different accusation on the table. But the point is, is that Hugh Edwards and Philip Schofield don't share political views, and I can assume they're probably more left-leaning. So when you have Russell Brand already being banded around the internet as a conspiracy theorist, according to the mainstream news, it plays into the into the rhetoric that they're picking on me because I'm exposing stuff they don't want exposed. So from my perspective, he, he is pretty much knackered. But the point that I'm trying to make is that you don't get a fair hearing if you don't have the right kind of opinions. James, is there a double standard at play here in reference to Schofield and, and Hugh Evans? And, and is the label conspiracy theorist uh, uh, an accurate approximation of Russell Brand's content? I mean, I don't I don't really accept the idea that the well, I, I do think that that what Philip Schofield did, for example, was not a was not a good look. You know, it's not something that I think was he I don't think he came out of that particularly well. But I, but I think the idea that the media is has historically been uh, had, had has historically given better treatment to you know married gay men than it has to promiscuous straight uh, super famous comedians. I, I just don't think that really stands up. I think if anything, the media has historically been much harder on people like Philip Schofield than it has on Russell Brand, and I think that's one of the reasons why Russell Brand could get away with what he did for so long because there wasn't that scrutiny. And I think this idea that he's, I mean, is how I, I don't really buy the idea that he is a threat to to the establishment. If you have the richest man in the world or one of the richest men in the world come rallying behind him and saying that, you know, this is that he, he doesn't believe the accusations. I think before he's even watched the documentary, like what kind of threat to power is this, this Russell Brand? Um, his conspiracies, they tend to be on things, you know, the COVID vaccine. Um, the war in Ukraine, he takes a very pro-Russian line. I mean, this is this is not a threat to power if we define power as, as the imperial Russian power, for example. Um, I don't think that this is really um, that this really stands up. I mean, we can speculate that he's this um, that everyone in power is terrified of Russell Brand. But I don't think that's really true. I think that journalists are being brought these stories of there have been journalists have been brought, brought these stories of someone who made huge, huge amounts of money, received huge amounts of adulation over almost 20 years in the, in the British media. And, you know, it, it's, it's something has to be some people wanted to speak out about that because the times have changed since the early 2000s when he, he first appeared on the scene and this behavior was considered more acceptable. One one last quick thing I'll ask James because it pertains directly to your your uh, piece and I've noticed you you include a lot of historic comments from Brand and a lot of clips are doing the rounds on Twitter now of problematic jokes etc which do seem rather you know uh, cringy in the context of the headlines now but are we are we reaching a point now where we we sort of getting to the point where we're penalising jokes now from a very conservative literalist standpoint I mean it, could it just be that he's joking about these things and creating a persona and doesn't really behave in a sort of sexually deviant way yeah I mean I I, I, I I'm not someone who's in favour of, of cancellation of people um, for, for comedy for example I think everything should can be potentially the subject of a joke. And I'm also, I also have concerns about this idea that platforms like YouTube can de effectively demonetize people or just, or cancel them based on their political views. This is a bit of a, 
form this is an almost a soft totalitarianism where as in the former soviet union you can just you can destroy someone's ability to earn an income uh because of their political beliefs and i i don't I, that that makes me very nervous and the fact that people say the fact that you have people on the left who will justify this and say well a private company can do what it likes well i was always brought up as a on the left to believe that private companies shouldn't be able to just do whatever they like that they should be should be reined in in, in some way um i don't think oh, that, that this is a whole new kettle of fish that we could spend hours on for yeah, sure yeah. james but i just want to get uh rebecca in uh on what she thinks of the you know being able to completely destroy someone's revenue streams based on allegations that have not reached a sort of court process oh i definitely don't agree with that i mean that's a whole fair press conversation i mean i, I but you know i guess it's a if, if I, it, I guess it depends on if, if it's a privately held uh, company or a publicly held company or whatever. But I believe in in free press and, and free media and being able to say what you you want to be able to say. And so I definitely don't think that anybody should be, um, you know, sh uh, their mouths should be closed because of any sort of allegations or whatever. I don't okay. agree with that at all. Charlie, if you can just sum up your closing thoughts in uh, the most eloquent way possible in 50 seconds or less, that'd be wonderful. Eloquently putting it, I would just like to see this play out in court. If, if anything, I mean, I don't, I don't enjoy seeing these kinds of things because I think it puts all men at risk of accusation without trial. And like I said, when I first came on the show, I think that if you are going to accuse a man of a crime, he shouldn't be outed unless he's been convicted of it. And I'll stand by that comment. Okay. Thank you for that. Maybe you can all just quickly one by one, let every, let our audience know where they can find more of your work, James. Uh, you can find my sub stack, uh, www.jamesbloodworth.com. And I'm on Twitter at J underscore bloodworth. Brilliant. And uh, Rebecca, where, where can people find more of your work? Yes, so I have a brand new book, Slay the Bully, How to Negotiate with a Narcissist and Win. I would love for people to join me at my launch, my live launch that's coming up, slaythebullylaunch.com, or my YouTube channel, which is at Rebecca Zung ESQ. And uh, you can follow me on Instagram at Rebecca Zung as well. So, Charlie, Charlie, where can we find more of you? Thank you. If you go to charliesansom.com, everything about me is there. Thank you for the unreasonably reasonable conversation from you all. It was, it was great to get all the different perspectives and viewpoints. So thank you very much for coming on to speak to us. I really appreciate it. Thank Thanks. you so much. It was really good. Take thank care. You. We always have this uh, awkward fumble to click everyone off, don't we, before we go. I never know. I never know if I'm going to leave it to Ash or whether I do it. Got an itchy clicky finger uh, but we're going to bring in our uh, final guest for the youtube section now uh, patrick boyle uh patrick thank you for joining us how are you sir can you steven hear me? thank you so much for having me how are you doing yes entirely my bit, pleasure uh, how are you broken up but i can hear you can you good we have a, i think we have a little delay i can all. hit oh good I... we have a delay okay so i i shall pause for dramatic effects after every question like this, <laughs> just so we've got the gist. But uh, I didn't, um, not so long ago, I, I got to see your uh, participation in that excellent Netflix documentary about the American uh, Boy Scouts. And it was kind of a an eye-opener for me. I didn't realize the scale of this scandal. I think somebody at the start of the documentary references the scale of it in comparison to the Catholic Church. And I thought, that's that's a huge claim. And then by the end of the documentary, it's 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 in, it's in completely accurate, isn't it? So maybe before we get into that, you can tell us a little bit about what you do. How would you describe your work? Great. I'm a uh, I'm a journalist, uh, a veteran journalist of several decades. Unfortunately, you can tell by some of the gray, probably. Um, <laughs> and I was uh, so I, I've done a lot of uh, work mostly on family and child issues over the years. Although currently I'm a, a medical a science medical writer, and uh, I was in daily newspapers here in the States for a long time. Uh, and that's how I got started on this many years ago. I could get into that at some point, but uh, I've been to you know daily newspapers, radio, uh, magazines, um, kind of what the American journalists tend to do bouncing around around the country. 
Okay, so a lot, a lot to pick up on there for sure. And I just wanted to tap into this thing that, I, you know, really, um, really affecting about the documentary and the themes you hear a lot of the time when it comes to crimes of this nature. And this this idea of sort of shame, how the the victims and it, it can be, uh, it's been suggested it could be a, a very uniquely male thing in a sense to be a victim of sexual abuse and, and the stigma uh it can cause not like it's not like i'm trying to trade one off the other when it comes to women at all but there's certainly something to this idea right. of men being ashamed uh, of speaking out uh, and almost feeling in ways to blame for their own you know injustices is that fair to say it's absolutely fair to say it's uh, and I, I appreciate you saying you're not trying to play one against the other with with women and men but uh it's absolutely true that when I began working on it, I first talked to a lot of sex abuse experts who made the same point you just did, that there's a special type of shame involved, especially when it's a man abusing a boy. And as you, and the boy, the, the men I spoke with, I, every victim I spoke with was, was an adult by the time I spoke with them. And, and I also read a lot of letters from victims and, and saw a lot of testimony from victims in the lawsuits. And they all talked about this incredible shame, uh, you know, a fear that they were if they didn't think of themselves as homosexual, but a fear that they were that they um, maybe maybe this is how they were, were coming off to people or maybe now. Well, I've had sex with a man, so I guess I'm gay now. My sexual identity was basically taken away from me and defined for me. And uh, it's not something you want to tell anybody as a boy. And again, you know, children do not want to talk about, obviously, for being sexually abused. For the, for the boys molested by men, there was a special kind of shame in that and not wanting to admit that. They didn't have any reason to think that they were going to get sympathetic treatment from, from their friends or from their families. Uh, and they really felt poisoned. And, you know, you, you talk to some of these people decades later, decades later, uh, like the, some of the ones that were in the film that you mentioned. And it's, it's taken them that long to get over that. Um, and the feeling that they did something wrong. Um, and the feeling... Because in this case, and it's same with the church, the molester is such a generally a respected member of society. You know, it's, it's a priest, it's a scout leader. It's frequently these guys that were literally awarded citizen of the year awards in their communities. They were friends of the family. So you also feel this incredible secret and the shame that you have to keep because you've done something wrong with this pillar of the community. And if word gets out or if you make an accusation, uh, you're the one that's going to get blamed. And that happened a lot. Um, so it, it's a very difficult thing to face. It's a very difficult thing to overcome. Yeah, you've described that really eloquently. Thank you, uh, Patrick. I mean, I suppose I'm getting ahead of the ahead of myself here a little bit. So uh, I was never in the, the scouts at all. I think I'm probably too lazy, not enough discipline. Uh, <laughs> I, I believe, though, I, I believe it's a British import, isn't it, for you guys? Yes, it is. It began not far from you. Um, in the first, uh, you know, Lord Ra Robert Baden Powell began it in the early 1900s in England. Um, uh, if you'll forgive me to shore up the uh, what he felt were the weak British boys, especially in the cities who <laughs> were not, you know, he was a war hero. Um, and he felt that boys were getting uh, just too cityfied, so to speak. Uh, and he basically wanted an uh, outdoor program for them and a, a program where men were learning how to be what he considered to be a man to live off the land to be responsible to each other in a military kind of way. Um, and in fact, the first uh, real official scout camp was in Gilwell Park in, in London, uh, which is where they had their first problems, by the way. But um, yeah, Lord R Robert Payton Bahal started a worldwide movement um, and a very successful one that really brought a lot of, uh, it's just helped countless millions of boys around the world. And let's be clear about that. It's a very good program for, for boys. It always has been. Um, and, uh, it, and it was imported to the U.S. in 1910 by somebody who had met Robert Baden Powell over there. And so they started the Boy Scouts of America uh, that year. Okay. All right. Well, I mean, you mentioned there that, that, you know, there were problems of the kind that are exposed in your documentary almost immediately with the very first, right. uh, uh, you know, uh, production of, of the Boy Scouts production. It's not quite the word, but you know what I mean? So, I mean, sure. something something floated in the documentary, which I found very interesting, was this defense from the, the organization, the Scouts, that... This is essentially something that happens in all organizations. You can't really mitigate for it. You know, any large organization has its fair share of, of deviants, people looking to harm people. And I suppose that's that's fairly true in a, in a lot of instances. But I think 
with the Boy Scouts, with it being primarily children, adults alone with children, there is something rather perverse about the fact that people looking to harm children in that way will gravitate towards roles where children are easily accessed. You know, the lions will hang around where the lambs are, so to speak. <laughs> yes. uh, so is there something to be said about how the Scouts has a far larger safeguarding concern than most organizations? Yeah, I, I would think so. And that's certainly what the what the courts and judges and, and basically the public have decided as well. You know, it's it's funny, Stephen, you mentioned what that lawyer said in, in the film, the scouts basically saying this is a societal problem. Nobody knew what to do. What's striking to me is that, that that's what they were telling me 30 years ago. I mean, exactly. It's sort of a what are you going to do answer, which is um, it's all over the place. No worse in scouting. In fact, they used to say the problem was less severe in scouting than the rest of society, even though they had nothing to back that up. And uh, they said they had nothing to learn from their own cases. I had read all these confidential files and they said, there's nothing to learn here, nothing we can change. Uh, what they told parents, it wasn't just me, they told parents in, in the troops, hey, we did the best we could. Um, we're, and they didn't say, we're sorry this happened. They didn't apologize. But what, what's, you know, you've pointed out what was pretty obvious, I think, to anybody at some point, which was that this kind of group is going to draw this kind of person at some point, you know, even though, though it's a minority. Um, frankly, I interviewed some molesters. I, I've interviewed eight or 10 molesters over the years from scouting. Several of them said they did not get into the scouting specifically for that reason. But then once they got in there, they realized they had some opportunities and they were getting very close to the boys. It's a really strange mix of motivations and, and urges these guys had. But then some of them did get in specifically for that reason. They bounced around among different troops, started troops for this reason, set up sex rings. Um, you know, it's as one one expert called the scouts a petri dish for sex abuse. You know, you have the situation where the scouts were set up perfectly for what you just described, not that they intended to do that. You know, you've got these figure these authority figures, these male authority figures, in uniform, by the way, with badges and medals and things all over. You're told to obey. Right? That's one of the part of the scout, the scout oath that you obey. You are isolated from your family with a lot of these men a lot. You go on campouts far away from home. You're intense. You're very vulnerable on a whole lot of levels. Uh, very frequently, they met with the scout leaders one on one, which you weren't supposed to do. But the scouts knew that was happening. They let it go. So they would become friends with these families. These leaders would and they'd have the boys over to their apartments and their houses, pool parties or one on one merit badge counseling or, you know, extra meetings in the church basement. So scouting by its very nature gave somebody a lot of access to children. You could pick children by the age group you preferred because scouting, of course, is set up by age group. You have, you know, the mm -hmm. Cub Scouts, the, the Scouts, and then you have Eagle Scouts. You, you go up through the, through the ranks. So you can pick 8 to 11, 12 to 16. Then you can take your time kind of figuring out which boys are the most vulnerable to you. Uh, and then you find a lot of opportunities to be alone with those boys. And then, of course, you find a lot of reasons for those boys to keep the abuse secret, as we just talked about. Uh, the boys would get very afraid of, you know, thinking on the scoutmaster, just as uh, you would, for instance, a member of the clergy. And that, I mean, you touch on something there with the, you know, the targeting of sort of vulnerable boys. And that's one of the, you know, the extra tragedies in that sense of this entire situation is that those boys who were sort of emotionally vulnerable or had a bad start in life were sent to places like this because they were told they'd be looked after and uh, nurtured and have sort of like father figures guiding them uh, they were particularly the individuals that were preyed on by these predators for that reason you said it exactly better than i could <laughs> I'll, I'll say it anyway but you you said it perfectly that was in what's ironic is the Boy Scouts knew this, uh, and what I mean by that is they would advertise themselves as a safe place for boys, but especially safe place for boys who needed a father figure, who needed they, – they marketed to single mothers a lot, and I talked to several single mothers who said, I, this is exactly what I needed for my boy. And so – but a lot of these boys, the ones who were most severely – had the most severe reactions – tended to be boys who were in fact had some severe troubles when they met up with the scout leader and so for instance uh christopher schultz the boy who committed suicide uh he was on the show uh, you know on uh, featured um you know i recently talked to his brother uh his surviving brother and we talked about how different those two boys were and christopher was the just the more troubled kid in a whole lot of ways um more fragile child um you know you talk about uh you know 
infant C, he's called, who was in a, a famous case in Virginia where the confidential files first really became available. Uh, he was an incredibly troubled kid. And the Boy Scout lawyers took advantage of that. Not only did the scout leader take advantage of that, the lawyers did when they got him in court in the lawsuit because they brought up all this trouble the kid had been in. And the fact that he had a, uh, a gay father and uh, what kind of marriage is this? And um, didn't, isn't it true you blew up mailboxes? The kid was not quite a delinquent, but he was getting there. Um, and so this the, the, the double whammy for a boy that you just described is that scout leaders would ex immediately target them. In fact, you remind me, there was a, a leader I interviewed in a prison in New Jersey uh, who said he could walk into the room the first meeting of the fall with the uh, with new boys and within minutes he knew who the kids were that really needed a father figure the kids who were either single single parent or or needed trouble and he would say i would latch onto that kid right away first day um and then then you go to if the, for those who went to court it was you know um dragging up just you know how it goes in lawsuits dragging up uh just everything you could about the kid and his family it's an incredible risk to take these guys to court Oh, that's that's even worse than I'd imagined. Okay, so oh yeah, I mean, and I can I can tell you real quickly. I read a couple of cases where they asked the, the boy, the lawyers for the scouts asked the boy if they enjoyed the sexual activity with the scout leader. Um, and you know what are you going to say? You were twelve. Um, what were you going to say? But um, you know this. So you can see it's pretty. This among the reasons it's really tough. And and you talk you opened up by talking about the stigma and and the shame. Well, that you know there it is. Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, just just looking at the reasons the scouts have put forward for creating a system where this happens way often, way too often, I should I say, uh, they yeah. will obviously uh, lean on the idea of funding and the checks necessary to vet people. They'll they'll talk about it being very difficult to recruit in these roles as it is without wanting to put people off by, you know, heavy handed security right. checks and the, the implication that maybe there's something wrong with these people that are applying. Do you buy any of this as an excuse? Um, I honestly try to not say I buy it um, as a journalist. I, I will, I, here, I'll tell you this though. Um, you know, that's for lawyers and judges have decided that and juries. Um, that is the, the story they put forward, but here, here's the counter to that. Um, it is true that another vulnerability of scouting to molesters is the fact that it's so hard to get volunteers. Uh, and this, I heard this continually from people throughout scouting, including molesters. I had a molester, again, a guy, he was out of prison. We talked up in, in, uh, in New Jersey, you know, <laughs> for three hours in a, in a car in a parking lot outside a diner. He was furious, still furious about the parents leaving him alone with all the kids. He ended up molesting a lot of them, but he did. He he, he said, "Yeah, I show up." I'd be, and you're not supposed to have one scout leader go away with the kids, but he had that happen all the time. It is difficult. So yes, the scouts would say to me, "You know, we can't put the volunteers through too much because we'll lose volunteers." That you know, honestly, for, as a parent who has volunteered in all sorts of youth groups over the years, um, thanks to those three kids in that drawing behind <laughs> behind me, uh, um, you know, I know how tough it is. But they were so scared of that that. I think at some point you recognize, you know, you're going to have to be frank with people and tell them why you have to put them through some extra checks or some education. The criminal background checks were interesting. Um, for a long time, the scouts just said, you know, we they do them now, but that we won't do criminal background checks. It's too expensive, et cetera. Even when it was really cheap, they said it doesn't matter. It puts people through, through, through too much trouble. And it, ultimately, most molesters don't have conviction records, which is true. But they had a lot of molesters get in who did have conviction records. Um, I think, you know, part of the point is, though, learning from what you learn from the scout cases is that if a molester was going to get in, then what happens and what they failed to do, and this may go further down the line, is their trouble really was what they did once they found out a molester was in their ranks and what they didn't do and, and how they hit it. OK, let's say that they, they get into schools, they get into wherever you want, sports programs, et cetera. You can't screen them. Well, first of all, you can do the best you can to screen them. Use the tools that are available. Don't pretend that's going to solve the problem. But second of all, the question is, what do you do once they get in? Um, but, you know, they also had, I they also, for a long time, after they developed some sex abuse education materials for both parents and boys and, and their leaders, really good sexual education, sex abuse education materials. They would tell the parents, look, we have this great video. We have these pamphlets, et cetera but they didn't require anybody to see them for a very long time. 
And I would say, well, why? And they said, well, we can't do that. We can't make the scout leaders go through this training. We can't make the boy, you know, the scout leaders show the boys one of these films. And they were very age appropriate. They had a couple of films early on for, for different age groups. And we can't make the local tr troops put people through a criminal background check, as you said, because it's trouble. Um, but the funny thing is the Boy Scouts of America make troops do a lot of things. You know, you get certified, you have to wear a uniform. You know, if they, they there, there are all sorts of standards of behavior, you know, check boxes you have to check. You know, you have to have an active troop. You have to have certain, you know, uh, number of leaders. You're supposed to have these kind of events. You're supposed to have camp outs. Uh, here's what you do for merit badges. There are a lot of rules when you run a Boy Scout troop. If you're if you're the scout leader, there's a lot of regulation. And I was surprised that they said we can make them do all these things. We can even decertify a troop if we find out none of the boys are wearing uniforms and you won't make them wear uniforms, but you can't make them watch the videotapes about sex abuse, you know, and, and you can't make the locals do a criminal background check, even when it just cost a few bucks. Um, that was surprising. And eventually they had to change on that. Eventually I think what happened is honestly, Stephen, the American culture kind of let them get away with it for a long time. Uh, that was okay. Cause people gave the scouts a lot of, a lot of credit, a lot of room. And gradually over the past few decades that eroded, and they realized they had to kind of cave in on this stuff and, and start doing the things they, they previously said they just couldn't do. Oh, so that's a great point. And I'm, I'm happy to hear there has been some progress in that regards. But you, you touched mm -hmm. on something interesting, which I'd, I'd really like you to expand on, because it sort of stuck out uh, at me as a kind of direct parallel to the kind of thing we saw from the Catholic Church with this with this idea of actually identifying somebody who was engaged in this sort of behavior. And instead of doing the right thing and, and getting rid of them or sending them to the police, they basically just allowed them to relocate and, and reoffend. So I suppose I can kind of be you know credulous enough to believe this is one big funding issue uh but the fact that these people are sort of covered up for and allowed to go on to reoffend kind of hints at a larger problem doesn't it yeah it does it hints i mean they were very concerned about the business um so but it's not just the the financial problems you talked about the fact is they had a i i liken it to a product defect and so let's say you make cars and you have a product defect that you think in your mind doesn't occur all that often. But boy, if people found out about it, we'd be in big trouble. And by the way, we don't really know how to fix it. So what they did was they tried to make it go away as best they could because they knew that if word got out about it, um, you know, that this, this is a golden goose. Uh, you know, the Boy Scouts of America is a nonprofit organization technically, but you know, in the States, when you're a nonprofit, maybe the corporation is nonprofit, but the people who work for it are not. Uh, they, they get paid pretty well. When I was looking in the scouts, they were making, you know, millions and millions of dollars a year in profit. You have to use that money a certain way, but they did make money and they recognized that. Patrick, I believe, unless this is my issue, uh, you've muted or you may have. We may have lost you. I don't know if those in the chat can give me a heads up and let me know if they can still hear and see me. That would be really helpful. It's such a shame because Patrick's such a great speaker and this is a really important topic. I think I'm back. Topic. Oh, he's back. Here he is. Patrick, please continue your thought. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And where did I where did I get lost? It was somewhere around here. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you were talking about it, it's more than just the, the monetary problems they had. And you're yep. talking about the, the, the people with, who actually do make a lot of money from the organization. Yes, they are. So th so they knew. So the, the files are filled with cases where they had said, you know, the scout officials in Texas, where they're based, were saying, uh, let's hope the media doesn't find out uh, because that will certainly help us, you know, here and around the country. They will sometimes work with police to keep cases quiet. Frequently, they didn't tell the police about the cases. They negotiated with parents. Hey, let's just let the guy go away. And all of this was protecting the brand. One of the lessons about that, it's not just a business decision. It's, it's called, it's, it's kind of an emotional buy-in. One of the things that, you know, the scouts in America, I don't know what it's like there, but in the U S it's almost a religion. Um, and so people were devoted to scouting in a way that was, was very much like people were devoted to a religion. And so there was a real circling of the wagons, so to speak, to use a cliche, and a sense that this doesn't happen a whole lot and you're going to ruin all the great work that we do. Uh, this was told to me when I started. You're going to ruin all this great work. I mean, the Catholic Church, you mentioned the parallel to the Catholic Church. It was the same thing. Why would you 
do this to us? Or why would we let this one case, they always pretended it was just one case. Why would we let this one case ruin all this wonderful work we do and this mission that we're on for the scouts? And it's easy for everybody in the organization to buy that. And I had, you know, going around to talk to both professionals and volunteers, um, you could see this. A lot of people initially when I first started out were really angry at me for digging into this and ruining all the work, that, threatening to ruin the work that they were going to do. So, um, yeah, they had a lot at stake. I mean, the Boy Scouts, as you said earlier, you know, it's built its reputation on being a safe place for kids. And uh, so they just they, they made molesters go away. They convinced parents to keep quiet. They convinced police to keep quiet. Sometimes, to my embarrassment, they convinced newspapers to keep stories out of the paper or at least keep the scout name out. Um, and they, they just uh, quashed it for for decades. Um, and that had a really boomerang effect, which we, if you want to get into later on, but I think that ultimately is one of the reasons they're in bankruptcy today. All right. Well, at this point, I'd just like to mention to the the chat, if you've got any questions you want to put forward to Patrick, I'll, I'll get them read out. Also, any experiences of the scouts, either in the UK or America that you think might be relevant, that'd be great. Uh, so, so Patrick, I just want to touch on this, uh, this issue of religion and, and the scouts and just to let you know where i am on this i'm a huh? sort of anti-theistic baby eating atheist so <laughs> my uh my red flags go up straight away with religious organizations i always start from the assumption of uh, suspicion and, and work backwards from there of course okay. you know that i don't attribute malice to all people of faith there are you know endless good people who do a lot of good things in the name of their faith and that's that's cool with me but it seems sometimes like a lot of these in organizations funded on sort of a religious ethos can cause issues because of that i know scouts actually is a, a religious organization unless i'm not completely mistaken it is of a christian character and you see a little bit of that in the documentary where a lot of this issue was attributed to homophobia for instance there was this conflation made yes. between mm -hmm. you know to child predators and homosexual men as if it was one and the same thing and a lot of that tends to come from a sort of conservative understanding uh, of things right. i'm just wondering where where you are on the on the religion influence in in all this yeah the way i look at it is you're certainly right about the religious influence yeah it's a, they're virtually a religious organization. It's, I mean, they do, they are based on Christian values. They were built for churches. Uh, one of the very smart marketing decisions they made is they structured their program so that just about any religion could adopt the scouting as its youth program. So the Mormons, for instance, that was it. I mean, officially, that was the youth program in the Mormon church. Catholic churches didn't quite go that far, but they also, they, 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 if you can get a scout troop in a Catholic church, they went for it. Um, and but there were Jewish organizations, Muslim, uh, you know, all over the place. Just about everybody could could use it. And because they they had merit badges that were built for for these religions, you could shape the program toward your faith. Um, as a result, these groups had a lot of influence on what scouting did in a lot of ways, but including with with child molesting and with you mentioned the homophobia. One of the reasons that the scout leaders were so uh, reluctant to deal with this is well, there were two. One is that the Mormon and Catholic churches in particular had a lot of weight, just and they did not want another group talking to their kids about sex at all, any type. Leave that to mm -hmm. us. Leave that to the parents. This is a moral issue. So, so sex abuse was a moral issue, but it was moral in that the, the way they got to it was we don't want to talk about it. <laughs> It wasn't the, the offense they were concerned about. They were talk, concerned about talking about sex at all. So the scouts stayed away from it because of that kind of that pressure. I mean, you had Mormon leaders and Catholic leaders in very strong positions on the board of directors uh, in numerous positions on the board. And of course, accounting for most of your money or the lion's share of your money coming in through fees, because they account for the lion's share of the, the troops and the cubs and the dens, et cetera. So you don't want to lose all that. But also, absolutely, there was within scouting, there is a real homophobia and a sense that if we could just keep out the gays, we'd be OK, that we mm -hmm. wouldn't have this problem, which is not at all true. The funny thing about that is when the scouts would be get they started hiring some some sex abuse experts to talk about this and they were schooled on it. And all these child sex abuse experts said, no, 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 no. The, pedophilia is a separate type of sexual attraction. Uh, and you can be a heterosexual man, man with women 
And many of these guys were, they were married, they had girlfriends, they had active lives, sex lives with women. And maybe that's not even your, maybe your sexual preferences in boys, maybe it is, but what you do with boys is a separate type of preference. And it's hard to get your head around that. I get that. Um, because the instinct is to say, well, of course you're gay because you're having sex with another male, but it wasn't the same thing. Um, and although the Boy Scouts had to kind of officially say that eventually in their literature, among the leaders at BSA Incorporated, there was still that talk of the problem really here is keeping out the homosexuals. Um, and so it is ironic, just as with the church, um, and, you know, Jewish groups have done this as well. Um, Orthodox Jewish groups uh, on the East Coast of the U.S. in particular have had numerous cases where they all also circled the wagons, kept abuse cases within their group, ostracized, publicly ostracized people who went to the police or district attorney for prosecution of sex abuse by a Jewish religious leader. Um, and so it is a, again, it's tribal. And it's a, a sense that you're going to you know, ruin our community and we should keep this within the ranks, so to speak. Um, and that's, I think that's what, what you, probably is part of what disgusts you a lot about the religious groups that cover this up, right? I mean, it's the fact that um, let's protect the group at the expense of the child. Definitely. And I think because I, I invoked religion and, and it just happens to be Christianity in this context in many ways, I, I am inclined right. or rather forced to pick a fight with the comment section now. I've had several comments from Sky Queen uh, telling me that I'm putting down Christians as I did this morning. Why don't you pick on of Muslims? I dare you. Now, uh, you might not be aware, but if you was to go to my Substack, which is a great time to plug it, my major preoccupation with a lot of religious harm is actually Islamism. And when people tell me they don't want me to talk about that, they call me an Islamophobe, much like you're doing from the other side when it comes to Christianity. So I'm, I'm an equal opportunity uh, offender when it comes to religion. Mm -hmm. But thank you very much for your comment. Mm -hmm. And just going back to this idea of safeguarding the children, because this is the most important thing. This is where reforms needed most out of anything that happened. And these are the lessons the scouts need to learn, obviously. In, in what ways could we um, Im implement changes that would provide a better safeguarding system? And I suppose just as a two-part question, something that, you know, concerns me a little bit is that it's very difficult for parents sometimes to be aware this is going on because obviously the child is impressionable, malleable, doesn't even, may not even realize something untowards happening, for instance. So how do we engender the this idea into the, the young adults and the children that these are the warning signs? How do we have that conversation without really a sort of exposing them to really dark and nefarious, you know, sides of human nature? How do we equip them to deal with this in a way that isn't mm -hmm. going to sort of, um, you know, expose them to harmful ideas? Yeah, well, it's going to expose them to harmful ideas. <laughs> so the idea is that, you know, yeah, you, no, you don't. Um, but I, I guess a couple of thoughts about that. Um, so there are a couple of things some, some youth groups have done, I mentioned in no particular order. One is for a youth organization, let's just take a, whether it's a school system, a religion, a youth group like the Boy Scouts, uh, you learn from your mistakes. And you look at your own cases, you just confront your own reality and you figure out what it is about your organization that is attracting molesters, but also I think even more importantly, letting them thrive once they get in and letting them get away once they get in. Because this happens, you know, you, we're talking about religion, but on a secular basis, public school systems in this country have had the same problem. Sports leagues, USA Gymnastics has had an incredible scandal about the exact, this kind of pattern. Not as many molesters, but an incredible number of victims. Yeah. Um, so I, a lot of it is, and, and I remember when I looked at USA Gymnastics and swimming, just to go back to this idea of learning from your mistakes, they just kind of buried everything as well. Oh, it doesn't happen very often. It'll ruin the program. You've got to at least yourself be willing to really look at your cases and figure out what's going on in the other adults around this person enabling the abuse and enabling the secret uh, and not tolerating that. And an organization has to make sure that it, it educates its leaders about it so that no, we don't, we don't just push this off as a, an aberration and we actually know the patterns of abuse. So, you know, I know that one of the things I think the BSA did horribly, that's a big lesson here is they, they left their own leaders, their own volunteers completely in the dark about this. You know, th th this program rests on volunteer leaders in communities running the program and they don't know about child sex abuse. <laughs> And yet they believe the Boy Scouts had almost no cases because that's what the BSA would say. Yeah, a couple of cases a year when they really had dozens. 
and the BSA wouldn't tell them about how molesters were using the group. So they didn't know when, say, I'm a scout leader, and you know, I wanted to have the boys over to my apartment. They didn't know, oh my God, this is exactly what happened in those three cases last year over in, you know, a neighboring state. So that that's one thing. The other is, um, you know, this is hard to, uh, too deep leadership is something that's bounced around a lot in youth groups, basically, that you, you don't have youth group leaders be alone with kids. Now that is sometimes almost impossible. But um, it's it's really got to be followed. You know, when I, I've coached a number of sports, as I mentioned, and um, my own protection too, I was never alone with kids, <laughs> with the kids on the teams. You know, we didn't go off somewhere and, and, and practice somewhere else or have them over to my house for private private coaching. Um, but also, you know, so you said, um, Stephen, without, I think what you're getting at is how do we educate kids and parents about this? Would I be right without going too far the other way and scaring them to think the world is like everybody's after them like the world is a yeah it's just, so, every it's adult like... is disgusting and that's a hard thing right yeah yeah so i think you know there's a way to do that and there are some really good educational materials out there i would say the scouts have some good ones um they just until recently didn't really require people to use them but there there are gentle ways to to do this you know we used to i don't know how much you guys did it there but you know stranger danger was a the big issue that when i grew up right you know, we're going to get kidnapped. Um, yeah. So we had no problem telling our kids about that. Um, it's hard to tell your child, any child, that you could be harmed sexually or otherwise by a trusted adult. And that's what this is about. It could be the neighbor, the babysitter, the youth group leader. I don't know of a way to do that. Uh, there are people who know more than me about how to have those conversations. And there are materials about out there about how you help parents and how you help youth group leaders have those conversations without scaring the kids into not leaving their houses. Um, but they have to realize that, um, you know, most people are good people and they're not going to do this, but here's a few things. If this happens, if that happens, um, you tell somebody right away. The most important thing is the kids have to feel empowered to talk yes. to their parents or somebody. They, they, if, if, if they feel I can tell somebody, I may, I don't know if this is weird or not. I don't know if this is the bad thing. It just made me uncomfortable. You know, it was in the shower or we, we crawled into my tent. Just you have to be able to tell somebody because, you know, light gets rid of a lot of this problem. Uh, if, if you shine light on something, if, if the kids are open and able to talk about it, if they feel safe, uh, a lot of it's going to go away. Or at least you're going to catch it early and stop it from spreading. And that's where the scandals come in, right? It's from, you know, all of a sudden you find out X number of cases in the church and 82,000 claimants now against the Boy Scouts. How did it get like that? And it got like that because of secrecy. Yeah. And uh, forgive my ignorance on this next question, but I'm approaching 40 and I have no knowledge of the oh. scouts. So I, but right. they, I am aware that they have filed for bankruptcy. Are they actually still operating as an organization? Do they actually still operate in the States? Yeah. You know, bankruptcy is a funny phrase here. Uh, people think it means you're going out of business. And sometimes it does. Yeah. But in large part, bankruptcy is a financial legal move to try to try to stay alive as an organization. So they're still functioning. What it basically does here, the, the type of bankruptcy they filed for was to basically get protection from all their creditors, the people coming after them for money and say, look, we need to take a breath. We need to kind of reorganize ourselves and try to reach settlements with people so we can come out on the other end of this financially able to still survive. And that's what they're doing now. And they, they've negotiated settlements. Um, there's still a lot. They're pretty far along. Uh from what I understand from some of the victims I've talked to, they still don't know exactly how much money they might get. There's always going to be a challenge, but uh, the Boy Scouts are, are still running their programs. Um, they've lost a lot. I can't give you exact numbers, but both in terms of youth in the pro program and volunteer leaders, um, yeah, they've taken a big hit over the last few years. They're not nearly as strong as they used to be. Okay. And I mean, you kind of a, almost answered my question there, I suppose. Next question, rather. And, and is this bankruptcy and these financial woes, are they a, a direct result of like litigation for, for these uh, cases of sexual abuse? It absolutely is. And, and the Boy Scouts said it right in their filings. <laughs> they said, you know, we have all these cases. Uh, this is where we found out they had, I think it was their filing that said 82,000 victims and the number of suits. You know, um, it's ironic. Um, you know, they had these confidential files about sex abuse and scanning, which became the cornerstone. Of, of my work in the cornerstone of the lawsuits that built up and then the cornerstone of more work by other journalists. And eventually those caught up with them um, and the lawsuits, they, they began losing these lawsuits. And once you begin 
winning when the when the lawyers began winning big. Uh, you can take this any way you want, depending on how you feel about lawyers. <laughs> I know how you feel about religion, though, Stephen. I'm not sure how you feel about <laughs> lawyers, but um, <laughs> you know, a lot of these guys, and I'm not blaming them because they they've helped me a lot. But they started hanging out shingles, and they became on their web pages and through their marketing materials like the, the Boy Scout sex abuse lawyers, and they weren't they went looking, they were recruiting victims. And, uh, you know, there were a lot of victims who never said anything. And, and, and so they, they came out and next thing, you know, you know, when I started out, it's amazing. I started out with 231 files about men, uh, people would abuse kids and I forget the number of victims there, but, uh, you know, it kept growing and now you've got, you know, thousands of files out there that were made public and people naturally latched onto that. You know, I, I talked to some victims who said, you know, I went online because the files through some lawsuits were made public and, I found my abuser was on there and I went to find a lawyer. Um, so yeah, this is what, uh, ironically, this secret file system they had, and then all the efforts they made to keep it secret and really not pay a whole lot of attention to it, you know, collectively, just individual cases and to really kind of ignore the problem has now become their downfall. Okay. And I know I appreciate you wasn't brought on to discuss this, but it's the topical backdrop of the UK at the minute and, and much of the, you know, the global news sphere. We have a very famous, uh, you know, celebrity who's been accused of some really heinous crimes in, uh, in you know, in print and via a, a documentary that was screened here. And they were having a huge debate at the moment about whether it's responsible to publish these allegations in the form of news media versus solely going through the justice system and the police and things like that. But it seems from like your work and your experience as a journalist, just exposing these things in the media can lead to convictions and, and wider awareness for victims, can't it? It can. It, it leads to a lot. Um, it, it's something that, you know, when you've had this happen to you, you think you're the only one. And I know, and, and you don't, tell me the case or not. I, I have a vague recollection of a celebrity person who's in, I think the news business or, or something. Is that who it is, what it was? It's Russell Brand. You know, the, um, he's a, he's quite a famous comedian in the UK. Tried to try to oh, sure. at Hollywood married to Katie. Oh, Perry sure. for a while. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. We were, yes. And, I was actually. I was, I was uh, unnecessarily vague for some reason. I think I've just had my fill of saying his name for one night. I think that's my way <laughs> probably, to be. I don't believe <laughs> this fame. I don't want to give him any more publicity. Um, yeah. yeah, you know. So I think your question is though. See, it's tough with that one because, like, I did not. Uh, I did name molesters if they were convicted. Um, otherwise, um, I didn't. And I think. Sorry, you know, just for, to for, clarify, for, I might, you didn't name them unless they'd been convicted. Yeah, yeah. Was, so I, was I that, sorry to interrupt again. Is this is this a, like a, a a principled approach, or is it a case of sort of protecting yourself from you know litigation? It was primarily principled, but it was lit litigation as well. I wasn't going to just um, name somebody in in print, um, but no, it was mostly you know I'll, I'll talk about the cases, et cetera. I mean, my, I was looking more collectively, and then when I found you know specific men who were willing to talk to me, I used their names. Um, and when they were convicted, I used their names. And if they were in lawsuits, I used their names. So I, I let the court make that decision for me. I, I think you've got a different case here with, with, with him because I know anytime an adult celebrity comes out, right? Cause you're not going to hide the name. It's pretty awkward. Um, he's got to have his day in court, but uh, so the, the media coverage has to, yeah, I guess you have to control it, but you're absolutely right. We, we saw it with, um, well, we can talk about a number of celebrities in the U.S., <laughs> including one, one who was running for a high office. But, um, you know, you know, and, and um, I think that it's been shown that adults, too, feel much more empowered when somebody else comes out and says, um, you know, hey, this happened to me. That's why you had a Me Too movement over here. Um, I think there's it's an unfortunate situation. But and with men of that kind of power, at some point, um, you've got to probably name them and and let the court case take it take its course and see what happens and the public has to keep that in mind when you read but it must be very difficult right because you're absorbing this over there um i mean tell, what do you think is he guilty in your mind i mean is that what happens you had to ask me that one didn't you patrick i think to me on a personal level i find the work done the journalist journalism wise to be compelling and done by credible individuals uh we'll never know uh I, i'm a little bit frustrated with how 
quickly people are writing this off as uh, as a lie or a fabrication. So I, I I kind of boringly lean to the side of it would be nice to see you know justice through the courts. But I appreciate I've sidetracked you on a completely different topic, and I, I just want to uh, pick your brains a little bit about you know the the hierarchy of um, the scouts. How, how how does this work? Is there some sort of kind of high priest of the of the scouts? And the second question <laughs> is, of course, uh, did any heads roll in response to all these? Um, you know, cases that were, were proven. I mean, surely even those in the structure uh, of the scouts who may not have been involved directly in any of the criminal activity, surely culpable in, in certain ways from a professional standpoint. Yeah, let me answer the second question first, which I find that people often do. And as a journalist, I get frustrated, but I'm going to do it now because you gave me the shot. Um, if any heads rolled, they did it very quietly. Um, so, the, the, yeah, there were no... Um, certainly no convictions of any top scout leaders for anything. And from what I have no, no firings or demotions or early retirements. I know of a couple of the people who used to run the, the basically washed over the system of collecting the information and keeping it secret who retired as scout leaders when it seemed like they should have retired, not, not sooner. I'll tell you what's funny. The, the two heads that I know that rolled were two men who they had, who were their chief child protection uh, executives one of whom um, w was, in fact, can, but because he was convicted of um, looking at child pornography, believe it or not. Oh, my word. Um, yeah. Yeah. So so that that was a shocker. Um, so if you wanted to prove your point about if you need anything else to prove your point about who's drawn to these these kinds of programs. Now, he wasn't working with kids. He was at the national headquarters in an office. But it was just it, when that happened, we just thought, how could you even write this? Um, you know, how does this happen? The other one was uh, Michael Johnson, the gentleman who was on the. Now he he quit, but he the uh, chief scout, the uh, chief child protection officer, who ran into, as you saw on the documentary, a lot of trouble and a lot of resistance at some point to many of his ideas, and he walked away. So uh, maybe their heads rolled, <laughs> but not his. But you know, scouting um, nationally is not like the church in that, um, by and large, it is a uh, it's a diffuse organization which helped them defend themselves in court for. For a very long time because if i run a local troop i i'm not beholden to the chief scout executive who's you know in any particular way it's true that i have to follow their regulations as i mentioned about how to run a troop and the finances have to be in order all that kind of thing but um, they don't do a whole lot of dictating the idea was to let the uh the sponsoring organizations decide how they're going to run their troops let them do it and that was their defense when they would get sued they'd say we don't pick the leaders we don't tell them what to do you can't blame us we're just we just provide this framework of a program for them. And then we kind of run it down at national and national headquarters. It's a, it's a pretty tight group of, uh, of basically executives, many of whom though did come up through the ranks. A lot of them were, were uh, scout volunteers. Then they became professionals. You do have professionals scattered around the country overseeing regions of the U S and then uh, at the top, what was interesting to me was on this particular issue. You basically had three people at scout headquarters who saw every file. It literally had their hands on every one of these reports. And that was it. Uh, people outside, those three people in the building never got a glimpse of anything, were never told. Um, you know, I remember speaking to the chief scout executive. I said, how many, Kate, do you think you have a problem? He said, no. I said, have you ever looked at the files? He said, no. And I don't think we have a problem because nobody's told me we have a problem. And if we had a problem, somebody would tell me. Um, and so you really had these three guys basically uh, literally going to somebody's office, sitting down, looking at the files, saying, okay, this guy's you know out, this guy's out, this guy's out. And that was it. And so it was a pretty, really close. Yeah, I was uh, walking around with this documentary on my tablet uh, before interviewing you. And that that line came up uh, that you just mentioned. And my, my girlfriend shouted from the other room, what? <laughs> uh so yeah that that is that is rather telling isn't it mm -hmm. uh, i mean forgive me if i've got the wrong end, end of the sticky but it seems like there was a lot of files uh documentation detailing these uh these crimes uh that were just kind of filed away and, and never really saw the light of day right. how, how is it possible to do something like that with with crimes of this nature so, i mean that that in itself seems illegal to me yeah for a long time uh there was no mandatory reporting and because of the decentralized nation, nature of the United States, which the 50 states, um, that's a very patchwork. Those laws are patchwork. So uh, uh, for a very long time, there was no mandatory reporting for teachers if they knew of abuse and certainly not down to the scout leaders. You know, for a long time, 
The scouts opposed those laws. Again, going back to the point you made earlier about leaning back on the finances and, and this is, you know, we need to, we're going to lose people um, that we can't be responsible for, you know, reporting things. And a lot of these cases are just accusations and we don't want to get sued by the molester. That was really strange. You know, Stephen, they, they kept in the files, they kept talking about keeping them secret to protect the organization from being sued for slandering the molester. And they, from what they've said, they have no cases. I've read a couple of files where the molester threatened. No, I'm going to take you to court. I'll take you for everything yet. They didn't do it. Uh, and I don't think, I don't know if they've ever been sued for that. Um, but yeah, for a long time, you could, you didn't have to report it. And, and this, this happened a lot. And I know that's pretty amazing. People would think, I would think you have to report that in most States. Now you do, but, um, and for a long time, the scouts basically said to people, we report when they were trying to get ahead of this, we report cases of child sex abuse, which now, if you were a parent, I think you would think that means if the, if a kid in your troop gets molested, the scouts are going to do what? Report that immediately. Right. No, <laughs> it means it depends. So what it meant was if there's a legal requirement to report it in your state, then we report it. But that's not how they put it to the public originally. They simply said, yeah, we report because sometimes they report if it was required. Now they have a policy of requiring reporting. But again, that was one thing, Stephen, they told me, no, we can't do that. We can't we can't put that burden on the local people to report things. That is quite extraordinary. Uh, Patrick, this is this has flown by. I've really enjoyed speaking to you. It's been it's been an eye opener. It's been uh, it's been shocking. And I would recommend everybody if they've got access to Netflix to watch your documentary that you're involved in uh, the full title of of which is Scouts on Earth, The Secret Files of the Boy Scouts of America. It really is an eye-opener. And it was something I thought I would be more uh, aware of given the kind of things I keep my eye on, but it, it even even blew my mm. mind. So thank you very much. It's so important that you're, you're you know, drawing attention to this and giving you know a voice to people who wouldn't have normally had a voice. So uh, thank you for that. Um, can you please let people know where they can find more of your, your work and writing perhaps? Yeah, that's very kind of you. Um, yeah, if you go to patrickboyle.us, just HTTP, you'll find my webpage and it has a link to uh, also has information about uh, the book that is the uh, basis of the the documentary. Uh, it's also called Scouts Honor. There's a lot of books called Scouts Honor. But um, yeah, so my book Scouts Honor is on Amazon, et cetera. But you can find a link to that as well on the website. And I will tell people this isn't really a financial plug because the book is out of print. Um, so it is kind of funny, Stephen. It's for sale now, but generally used like somebody has it sitting in their house and they don't want it anymore. So they're putting it up for sale. <laughs> and, uh, and so it's second or third time around, sometimes asking ridiculous amounts of money. I'm really offended. Um, but, <laughs> and, and, <laughs> but you can get it's it on Kindle. Well, but in, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's quite funny to see what people are asking. But uh, yeah, so patrickboyle.us and you'll, you'll see some of my work, including a link to the original newspaper series as well. Patrick, I've really enjoyed speaking to you. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for giving up your time to talk to us today. Stephen, it's been great. And thank you for for being so intelligent about this and, and measured. I really appreciate the insightful conversation. Uh, That's so, really so kind. Thank you so much. No, thank no, you very it's, much. It's really, it's really, really important. This is, this, is, this is a topic that can go the wrong way. And uh, I think I really appreciate how you handle it. Thank you. That's, that's lovely to hear. Thank you. <laughs> What an absolutely fascinating guy. That was brilliant. And I've been watching the documentary as well on Netflix and it is harrowing what it needs to be told. Absolutely. Yeah. It's uh, like I said, it blew, blew my mind to, uh, the extent of the issue for sure. Yeah. Like I said earlier, I thought the Catholic church was the biggest perpetrator of these crimes, but apparently the boy scouts eclipsed them. So but there's good and bad in everything. And it's just, you know, when we shine a light on this stuff, it makes parents more vigilant as to what can happen, especially with people who come into our kids' lives in positions of trust. So wherever you are in the world, always keep an eye on what's going on. Huge thank you to Stephen Knight. The panel that he hosted was fantastic. I've been mesmerized all night by these different perspectives on Russell Brand. Huge thank you to you viewers for all the questions. And if you've got, if you want to support our the people who've come on tonight, all the links are in the description box below the video. So please support their work. It incentivizes them to come back. And also, we're just a couple of hundred subscribers away from 800,000. So give us a little push and we'll have our celebration 800,000 on live stream soon. Anything you want to say in conclusion, Stephen? I think I have potentially said enough. <laughs> <laughs>
for, for one evening. But yeah, th <laughs> thank you to all the incredibly intelligent <laughs> intelligent guests and, and contributions in in the comments. This has been a really easy job given the the uh, the mix uh, and intelligence of the guests we've had tonight for sure. Yeah. Also, we've had so many different perspectives on Russell Brand tonight. I see some people have been offended if they don't agree with their viewpoint. But in the interest of balanced reporting, that's what we're trying to achieve on this channel. And I spoke to Ash and he said he's looking at doing even more panels next week. So let's see how that goes. Until then, much love and respect wherever you are in the world. Thanks for watching. I'm sure I'll be back tomorrow afternoon with a Russell a Brand news update. Um, and I'm trying, still trying to get steeples on for tomorrow night too. Cheers, everyone. Take care in the world. Wherever you